Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Comic Art Live show. We've got a, a wonderful show planned for you tonight. I've it's, it's been several months. I've been trying to get Jane Frank to uh, have some time to be on this uh, uh, and for an interview and to talk a bit about her uh, her time as a collector and art dealer. And that that time has finally come. We can get to talk to her tonight. So let me welcome Jane into the uh, show here. Jane, nice to nice to finally meet you in person. Though, of course, like we were talking earlier. Uh, we've been at IX together many times in the right. past, but uh, have not run into one another, which is kind of hard to imagine given the fact that it's not the biggest show in the world. But That's uh, correct. It's one of those lively shows in the world, but it's not thousands of people like Dragon Con. No. Exactly. Exactly. So, but I blame myself. Like I told you, I, I tend to just kind of uh, hang out with the people that I know. And uh, it's, it's that shy thing that goes on still for me when I'm out in public. I don't. You know, until I meet somebody, it's uh, it's it's problematic. But uh, but I'm glad we finally got to meet because you said you've been going to IX since it started. Since it started, I in fact Pat gave me a a special little trophy and a badge for my tenth year there. I think this is year fifteen, um, and I knew him before he started this convention when he was living in the D.C. area, mm -hmm. and so we got to know each other way back. Uh, and like many people in this field, when you know somebody well that way, you're tempted to attend their conventions. And that's mm -hmm. one of the fun things about conventions. You get to see the same people. And there's some people there that I have known for, oh, 20, 30 years. I only get to see them once or twice a year. But I, but for a long, over a long period of time, yeah. No, that's, uh, that's true. I mean, uh, we actually had Pat on, I think, probably about a month ago and he talked about going uh you know going to your place when you were in the in the dc area uh right. you know what a uh, what, a, what an experience that was to see all the artwork and you know the way you presented it at the house and everything so he talked very fondly of you but it, but i know that you know you hit you you've been an important figure in the hobby for or I, I always call it a hobby i mean what i don't know what else to call it at the end of the day but uh you know because you've you've been in those circles with the artists for so long, you've been a collector, and also you've known many of the collectors. In, in just because you're a fellow collector, but also because you were selling to them. So I mean, you've been a, a very important figure. You've got lots of great stories, uh, I think, to tell, and uh, that's why I thought you'd be a great guest tonight. Well, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, it is a surprise when I meet people. You know, they say, "Well, how long have you been doing this?" And I say, "Oh, well, I don't know, uh, about 50 years." And they say, what? <laughs> <laughs> How is that possible? <laughs> right. But it is. It is possible. Um, I, it wasn't, though, the case of many collectors who remember with great uh, nostalgia the books that they read when they were kids or comic books that they were reading when they were kids. I did collect or I did buy Weird Tales comics. You know, mm -hmm. I was a, a fan of those. I bought them every week for 10 cents. But uh, I wasn't really a reader of science fiction and fantasy until after I got married and just about as a high school senior when I started dating my late husband. And he decided that the only way we could have a decent conversation was for me to catch up and read what he had been reading. So he brought over a cardboard box filled with Skullface and others and A. Merrick Chip of Ishtar and um, a couple of Haggard books and El Spray de Camp and said, here it is, read these. And so I said, okay. I mean, uh, the only thing I ever knew about science fiction was Jules Verne mm -hmm. and fantasy was Edgar Allan Poe. That was as far as I got. Um, but this opened up my eyes to the books, not the illustrations, but the books. And from then followed the art because at some point in time, you have to cover your walls with something. <laughs> that is very yes. true. <laughs> and it, it, yeah, Brett Mixon you know, said, it's not a hobby, it's a way of life. And uh, so, yeah, That's if you've been right. doing it for 50 years, it certainly is a way of life. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And you start thinking, and, you know, it's funny. You go to conventions, I see the same people, as I say, year after year. They know nothing of my private life, really. They only know me as a collector or a dealer in this, okay? Mm -hmm. They have no concept or knowledge of me as another person, as a mother of three, a grandmother, uh, getting a PhD in linguistics, a teaching college, you know, all these other things that I've done. No, 
they know nothing about that, but they illustration. And that so is a, so were you a collector before uh, you know you met your husband, or was that something that kind well, of? Well, I had. I interestingly, I, in fact, I met a someone who bought art from me at um, Windy City um, in uh, April, and it's interesting. I I had an advantage in a way. I grew up with a father who was a, a coin dealer. He was a numismatist, mm -hmm. and so I spent my childhood actually filling little blue Whitman folders. I don't know if you're familiar with the little uh, where you put, stick the pennies in in the quarters. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And for fun, he would bring home bags of coins like pennies. And I would look through them trying to find a 1909 SBDD or something rare, right? A uh, Indian sense or something. Mm -hmm. And so I was raised by someone who was interested in that and in other collectors. So I was familiar with conventions from the time I was growing up, coin conventions, and meeting other collectors. And I realized as a child that once you're a collector, you could be collecting almost anything. So people who collected coins also collected Indian uh, arrowheads mm -hmm. and, and you know, all kinds of strange Roman beads, you know, and because they collected one thing, they might collect another. And so I was comfortable with and used to walking into homes filled with all kinds of stuff it wasn't weird to me you know um and so i had a leg up i knew all the games that dealers played right um, all the buying and selling tricks um my father taught me so was, and, did your father do that as a uh, as a hobby or was that a no, he, was a, no he did it as a, for a business okay any rare coin company and then um stein steinberg coins so anybody who's familiar with Coin World or going to conventions would note the name Steinberg, actually. That's okay. Nice. Yeah. Interesting. And so, uh, and so I developed the love of primitive money, what they call so-called odd and curious. Had a major collection of that, which I sold off for the most part. But um, so I was enamored of elephant tail money and um, Sices, you know, uh, silver ingots, um, you know, once you're into this, right? <laughs> you're into this. <laughs> so it was, I've always been um, sort of half and half. Howard was a pure collector. You know, once he had it, he never let it go. You know, just the Frank collection was a black hole that way. You know, never traded, never sold until the time came that we mm -hmm. did. Now, did uh, he? I, how did you start? Uh, how did you and Howard start collecting art? Was that well? Or? He was raised by a father. Who, who read him pulp stories from pulp magazines. Mm -hmm. So he was a, he was the book collector. By the time we got married in 65, um, he already had a major collection of books. That's what he loaned me, you know, to read. Um, and then we decided we have to do something about our walls and so on. And we, and we started going to Star Trek conventions at the Commodore Hotel in 1967, I guess it was. We bought our first if you want to show this, uh, 1967. By 1967, we were writing Arkham House. In those days, uh, you know, this is way before the internet, of course. So we wrote letters. Hi, we saw we saw Frank Goodpottle's drawings, and we we're wondering if we could get in touch with him. And so, sure enough, we get letters from Frank Goodpottle. And at that time, we could only afford fifty dollars a piece, and so he sent us six of these kinds of interiors. And we said, okay, we'll take four of them. We couldn't afford to buy all of them. Um, and that's how we started. We actually wrote publishers and said, can we get in touch with the artists there mm -hmm. uh, and buy the art? Uh, we bought, uh, we realized very early on actually that there were no art galleries that would ever have the art that we wanted. Um, and there were no prints. So we started with Tolkien cal calendars and tore out the pages and framed them. Okay. For prints. That's right. No, it makes sense. I mean, prints didn't get really big until the seventies. So you had to do stuff like that. You had, you had no choice. That's right. Mm -hmm. So calendars were a good source though. Yeah. All the time was producing those Tolkien calendars and, you know, anyway, we, we just tore them apart and put them in frames and that was art. We couldn't afford anything more. And so for quite a while in the beginning, $50 was our limit which would probably be like $150, $200 today for starters, okay? Mm -hmm. um, by 1970, 
uh, to 75, we really, we realized we really like this stuff. And the only way we're going to get it um, is to try to find people who had it. And by that time, uh, Howard was already buying books from people like Jerry De La Ray mm-hmm. in New Jersey. I don't know if that name means anything to you. Um, he was a former uh, newspaper reporter, sports reporter, a oh. newspaper man. And he became a book dealer. And he started in New York and Fourth Avenue, and then he moved to Saddle River, New Jersey. And we made treks there. So second picture, we started buying things like um, Lee Brown Coy, um, little you know doodles by Clark Ashton Smith. Again, 50 bucks. At the time he was, I think he was representing uh, people who had them like estates. And so along with his books, he would get this kind of stuff. Um, and so he became a resource for this. Um, and then through him, we met a guy named Gene Nigra. Uh, again, this is at the sort of the beginning of things, but he turned out to be a guy who bought an entire collection of Hannes Bach, whatever wow. was left in Hannes Bach from, uh, what was his name? Peacock in New York, who had inherited Bach's entire inventory. And we ended up trading movie posters, which he got somewhere, which I don't remember where, for Bach. Wow. Okay. And one thing led to another. Uh, what can I say? Um, we just dove in, um, but again, for very little money. Uh, it was through people like that, and here's an example of an early, you know, Finley piece, a Bach piece rather, uh, would be the kind that we bought from Gene. We traded, I think, eight, eight of, we got eight of these for a movie poster. We didn't know what to do with. We just bought it because we said, somebody's going to want this. I don't know how we got it, but uh, we did. So, so you're kind of, you know, we call that a, you know, a war chest today. You're kind of, you know, setting things aside, knowing that uh, at some point they will work to your advantage to maybe pry a piece loose from somebody else or, right. you know, work, then, work their way then, into a deal for you. Yeah. It was just a sort of a um, fun for us to think that we could actually buy original art for a movie, mm-hmm. a movie poster. That's just the idea of being able to do that. Um, it was during this time in 1975 that we went to our first world fantasy convention. It was the first one in Providence, Rhode Island, the very first one. And we were amazed. I mean, this is where we met people like Stuart Schiff, uh, people that we had corresponded with for a time before then, but had never met in person. Uh, Stuart published Whispers Press, okay. a journal that he put up quarterly every uh, four times a year. And we started meeting people people that we still know today at that time. And we realized that it was through Jerry that we could meet people like Gene and other people like a gateway for us. Um, it was just fantastic to us. So the mid the mid seventies were a big time for us. We started going to conventions. Um, uh, we met people like uh, Robert Wiener, um, uh, big collectors of the day, uh, but especially the authors, we started now, at, th- at this time. Though there's really no uh, like major art dealers or whatnot, right? You're, you're yeah, typically yeah. either yeah. buying from other collectors or you're buying direct from the no, art. Did, there were no other collectors, really. Yeah. Um, the idea of collecting this kind of stuff um, was strange, and the only way we actually started buying is because it, there came there was a time when artists. Uh, started going to conventions and was basically late in the 70s when they realized that they they were going only reason that artists went to conventions was to meet the editors and the publishers to get jobs so they had an art show the art show was really to attract commissions Mm -hmm. it was not to sell art at all but then came the time when they realized that people might be interested in this and i had to kill time because i couldn't help howard buy books i ended up in the art room in the art show. And pretty soon they had bid sheets mm-hmm. and we started buying. <laughs> and um, and that's how we did that. Um, the first color piece, I don't know where we are in the slides. Um, 
Uh, let's see. I can pull them up here. Pull over the next one. Going. This is the first color piece we ever bought. It was from Jerry Delarie, Earl Berge, a piece I still have for nostalgic reasons. Um, That's typical gorgeous. Redhead, typical redhead. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was redheads or blondes. There were never brunettes in these paintings. Um, and we just fell in love with it. And we visited Jerry. Jerry was a gruff, um, kind of tough kind of guy. He liked me. And he saw that I admired this. He says, you want it? I'll sell it to you. I said, really? How much? He said, $75. We said, we'll take it. <laughs> at the time, that was a bargain. It really should have been like 150 or two. Right. OK. But he, because he liked us, he gave us a bargain. That was well, and he could tell that you liked it, too. I mean, that, that had to have gone a long way as well. Actually, Jerry was a model, a role model for us. He was the only person we had ever met that had his house filled with art. His basement was filled with books, but his living area, the kitchen, the bathrooms, the bedrooms, every place in the house was filled with artwork. Um, we had never known anybody like that before, someone who actually did that, this kind of art, that is. Because mm -hmm. if you can do it, we can do it, you know. And so we proceeded to do that. <laughs> what can I say? Um, no, that's not bad. I mean, as far as, you know, if you're to pattern yourself after somebody, he sounds like the perfect, right. perfect one. I mean, I mean, especially a, a, a true kindred spirit for you, right? I mean, yes. and doing something that uh, showed you it was okay to collect it and to hang it and display it and let your friends appreciate it too. Exactly. And the interesting thing is that, that the early days, like in the mid 60s, uh, 70s, we weren't buying contemporary art because we had no way to find it. Mm -hmm. It was only until we started going to conventions and meeting the artists and actually seeing that art that they had done for books that we were able to acquire it. So next picture here. Um, we went, for example, to an interesting convention. It was in the Playboy Club in Great Gorge, New Jersey. Of all and places. There, and of all places, we traveled there. And there it was. And it had a bit sheet and I don't know how it, it, th those days were different than today. They had a, when the, when the convention uh, art show was over, they would have the people who ran it would herd everybody out. They'd form a line and they'd force everybody out. No more bids in the silent auction on the bid sheets. So what people would do would stand by their chosen pieces and guard them to prevent other people from sniping and from signing their names <laughs> to them. Because after this was over, they had a, a, a voice auction, but maybe six to eight bids for the silent auction. Mm -hmm. So as a result, we were able to get this for $300. This is another Bach, Loss of Gravity, uh, from 1951. And uh, what can I say? Um, it, it, oh, the bitch had said collection of Jack Gone. So we said, oh, wow, this belonged to an, you know, another artist. I wonder exactly. how he got it, right? And then a strange thing happened. Uh, I'm going to say mid-80s. We got a phone call out of the blue from someone who somehow found out that we owned this. Maybe someone had been to our house. And they said, I'll give you $50,000 for it. And Howard was standing near the phone. He said, how much? He said, 15. He said, tell him no. <laughs> I said, you're 15, five, zero. <laughs> he says, tell it. <laughs> right. Send him on his wave or no, no, no. It's, 50, 15, it's okay. No. 15,000 from 300 is too little, but 50, yes. The done deal. Done deal. That's... Because we thought, my God, this pays for all the college education for our kids. I mean, you can't get so crazy about collecting that, that you lose sight of reality. You know, I mean, and the reality is, is that was a huge amount of money. Now, the funny thing is that if this piece were to come up for auction today, it could easily get to 50. That's the funny thing. So mm -hmm. it, it, this doesn't happen with every piece of art, but being prescient, maybe. I mean, the whoever bought it, um, and I I don't know who that was. I, I never knew the fellow. What were you, check? Interesting. In California? It, very interesting, yes. Uh, somewhere I mean, did you, did you did you discover the history to the piece? I mean, for uh, Gone to I, that, I mean, that, 
you have it. I want it. That was I'll it. Send you the check. I said, all right. <laughs> <laughs> now that's somebody's house you want to be able to go to someday. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. house. Yes. And and I, I suspect it was someone uh maybe a celebrity mm -hmm. of some sort, you know, who dealing with through somebody else um is what I'm suspecting after all these years. That it's actually someone pretty well known. But who knows? So you never saw the piece again, though. It never went uh, as no. part of a traveling show or anything like again. that. Never seen it again. Never heard of it again. No one has ever remarked. You know, I saw that. You know, uh, no one's advertised it. Um, you know, said it's like on comic art list. You know, art comic sure. art fans. You know, saying I've got this and you don't. You know, um, no. By the way, it was published flipped. Oh, was it really? <laughs> yes. So the actual magazine, if you could imagine, this is flipped. There you go. And that's how it was published. Wow. And so it was strange to us when, when we got the art and we compared it to the magazine. Marvel, it was. Marvel, number 39, 1951. Wow, and crazy. also in 1976, um, we bought uh, at the second World Fantasy Convention, which is the next picture, because, of course, we now know Jack gone. Right. Okay. And so he said, oh, okay, let's buy this second world of uh, war of the worlds. Um, not the best painting in the world, but then again, it was war of the worlds. And so, you know, that attracted us, but this was sort of the beginning of, since this is a DAW paperback, uh, 1976, this was sort of the beginning of uh, I would say more contemporary. Okay, bear in mind that we're talking mid '70s as contemporary here mm -hmm. art. So it's going to seem the '70s, by most accounts, are not considered the greatest decade in the world for art. Um, it's considered to be one of the most boring decades for illustration art, actually. Uh, so it wasn't a surprise that we, we figured this out later. By the way, not when we bought it, we were happy to get it. Mm -hmm. But the '80s were really the golden age of illustration art. See, but I, you know, for me, you know, I, I was born in 68. So a lot of the science fiction books that I was seeing, uh, you know, my uncle's read or whatnot were books, you know, from this era with covers like this. So I always, I, I liked the art that, you know, that went into the seventies paperback covers. I just thought, it, you know, it, it, maybe it's not super dynamic or anything like that, but this is, this is the nostalgia part for me when I see it, see well, a that's right. like this. That's right. So, and that's the thing. I mean, there are people who buy solely because of its association with either their favorite author. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they only buy, uh, you know, Philip K. Dick. They only buy Bradbury. They only buy the, or they only buy uh, by subject matter. You know, only uh, mermaids, only dragons, only spaceships. You know, mm -hmm. or only by character, only Tarzan, only Doc Savage. You know, only Doctor Who. I don't know, whatever. You know. Uh, we tried to, we were more eclectic than that. So we had a combination of things that were both tied to famous stories, you might say, or authors, but at the same time, we looked for the quality of the art, you know, to work as a painting, not just as a book cover. A lot sure. of things as book so, covers make lousy art. Were you uh, still being engaged as a reader as well? Because, uh, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't let you not keep reading, you know, the stories. Oh, I assume yeah. he, he continued to read. And, yeah, uh, you know, I, always was, I was. Uh, I didn't read everything. Um, I did read, of course, you know, Heinlein, Bradbury, you know, all the Asimov, all the, the sure. things, everything, you know, there were like um, the checklist, you might say, of everything. But I really did like the older stuff. And I liked Van Vogt. I liked, uh, I liked the humor of uh, Sprague de Camp. You know, uh -huh. I liked that. A more whimsical stuff. Um, I wasn't as crazy about space operas, you know. I like Philip K. Dick. Um, you know, I was, I was pretty well read, you know. So, but uh, but I really did like, you know, Robert Howard, and you know, uh, <laughs> sorcery. What can I say? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, anyway, yeah. I, I mean, I kept it up, but there came a time when I just couldn't keep it up. There was a time. Uh, in fact, we had this conversation with Sam Moskowitz back in the day, um, when you could be a Renaissance man or woman, when you could have read just about every book that was important in the field. That ended about the end of the 60s. 
and that and that was like the cutoff point. After that, the field exploded. Many new, you know, people writing into mm-hmm. this in the most popular genre. You know, uh, let's face it. Um, yeah. You know, took up the most space in bookstores. Uh, but until that time, you actually could have read everything. And so there are people who who did, you know, who could have said that, you know, like Bob Weinberg, you know. Sure. No, yeah. I agree. I get it. That makes sense. Yeah. Anyway, um, we be, it started that we be, we became uh, convention goers about this time. OK, uh, we realized we really did need to um, meet people and see people. And some of the people that we met at the time, we still know today, uh, which is weird, but true. So what, uh, what uh, conventions were you going to? Just science fiction kind oh, of fantasy oh, conventions? Oh, or? World cons. World First, cons yeah. oh, well, we lived in New York. So we went to Lunacon, uh, Boscon, um, Philcon. Those are the top three. Later, we added Arisia. Mm-hmm. But originally, those were the three top in the Northeast. Um, when we moved to the D.C. area, we added Balticon, Disclave, that was the local convention, and we started going south to LibertyCon, Chattacon, to meet all the Southern artists. And I'll show some of the works as we go through here. Uh, but we realized we needed to do that. We became regulars at all the, at the World Cons, um, at World Fantasy. When they started the World Horror, we started going to those. Um, so no, you know, I don't know a lot about the history of those, those early cons. I mean, are you meeting? Are, are the shows focus the authors more than the artists, or uh, or yes. what? Yeah, is that yes, the panel discussions? Yeah, right. the art was the art was um, fringe. Mm-hmm. Like I said, the the only reason the artists went were to get jobs. They spent their time showing their portfolios to the uh, art directors. Um, but we got to know them because we showed up when they were setting up which we did, uh, then we would be able to buy the paintings before they ever got up there, you know. Uh, yeah, that same strategy is employed by uh, collectors to this very day. <laughs> exactly. So they, we, Anybody we, with an exhibitor badge. Right? Yes, and they'd be sitting there, you know, <laughs> what am I going to charge for this? I don't know. What, you know, Dean Morrissey sitting sitting with this painting. He says, Dean, what are you going to do with that? Well, I don't know. And I said, well, we'll take that from you before you can put it up. You just put NFS on that one. Okay? Right. Put, put the red dot on it right now. Oh, well, yeah, oh. and that, yep, not, not even <laughs> bother with that. But yeah, uh, we were, we showed up. Um, we it, it's really funny. We, we became good friends with um, someone whose name I will not mention. But because of their situation, they were able to show up on a Thursday. You know, the, the conventions went from Thursday to Sunday, mm-hmm. and so they would show up on a Thursday. And they liked the same kind of art we did, okay? We, because Howard worked, could not show up until Saturday morning, right? I mean, right. <laughs> oh, so much time to the convention. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we, we, we <laughs> would show up, and because we were far more decisive and always had been in our decision, we would walk around the show and immediately buy and put our names down. We, had a, we ended up with a gentleman's agreement with this person. We said we can both afford to buy what we like here, so there's no sense in spending two thousand dollars when we could spend five hundred, fighting off each other, overbidding. There's enough art here for anybody to be happy. So we made a deal that the first person who put their name on the bid sheet, we wouldn't overbid. There could be other people bidding, but we would not bid against each other. Okay, as a gentleman, mm-hmm. we never told the artists this because they would hate to hear this. It's so true, never, but the same thing goes, you know, but that's how it is today. You know, like uh, two collectors will talk about a piece they see in an auction, uh, you know, coming up or something. And they'll be like, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to pass on this one for you. And, it, you know, you can't, you can't uh, say who else is going to bid against them. But as long as that person who uh, you're friends with leaves it alone, you know, sure. It, it, it's it, time we got over it. You not have achieved a, a smaller <laughs> amount, but it, it, but I get it. I mean, it, it's, it, you kind of have to do that. You have to get savvy and smart. Oh, you do. I mean, back the big, you know, before um, auctions were live on the internet, um, Sotheby's and Christie's, this is how we met Jerry Wiest and mm-hmm. uh, Joe Manorino and Nadia, because they were consultants for Sotheby's and Christie's in the day. Right. And um, they were all live. So we would fly to New York if we were living in DC. We, we would go to the previews 
and we would meet the same people. We would, we would be hiding our catalogs or our paper catalogs so people wouldn't see our marks, our notations. Because we, you know, people would walk around looking over our shoulder. What are you going to bid on? Right? That's right. And so we have to keep it a secret. They would call us up. So are you going to be going and bidding on the so-and-so's auction? And we'd say, maybe, maybe not. Well, they said, well, what are you interested in? I said, well, <laughs> I'd rather not say. <laughs> Well, we've yeah. had Joe and Nadia on a few times because uh, you know they're they're at Heritage right now, so they do the Heritage previews yes, with me. But we've talked about. about we've talked about their collecting interests as well, and and they're kind of like we didn't mention this. We talked about this in the green room. The people who have very uh, you know very wide reaching collecting habits. I mean, Joe seems to enjoy a lot of different things. You know, uh, old lamps. Uh, you know, you name it, glassware. He 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 likes just about everything. So uh, you know, that's it. it you can be a collector of focus or somebody who just is very widespread. I mean, there, there, there are a couple who are very. I remember, I remember we were sitting in a, at a, an auction and Joe was next to us and a Frazetta came up, a Western. And nobody's bidding. I said, it's, it was $15,000, which you know, wasn't cheap, but it wasn't what you would expect, you know, mm -hmm. for Frazetta. So Joe said, bid. No one else is going to get it. You know, you never know when you might need ammunition. It's Frazetta. I said, okay. So for years, we then we started growing fond of it. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we liked, you know, Westerns especially, but hey, eventually we did, you know, trade it away. But yes, Joe knew ab about everything. And that's how we knew about Frazetta. I mean, he was. Yeah, yeah he. Uh... We didn't get a chance. We've never talked too much at length, but I know that he worked with the with Frank, you know, and the family for a while. So he, I told him right. we should do a, a whole show just on his experiences working with Frank Rosetta because I'm sure that could fill an hour easily. I think we should. There came a time when, like everybody else, who made the pilgrimage to East Stroudsburg, you know, mm -hmm. the time when the museum was on the second floor above a storefront, and then we ended up going to the the opening of the museum and meeting him. You know, I never went. I hate to say it. And I live in Northeast oh. Ohio. I never went. Yeah. I know. I'm. I. I it was. I it was regrets to this day. But yeah. I mean. But anyway, that's how we. We we realized that actually artists were more fun than authors, um, as much as we enjoyed the company, of of people like uh, Ted Sturgeon, um, and so on. People in the New York area that flitted through. I don't know. Artists were more fun. <laughs> we, we discovered that that authors were not as verbal. You know, they were that their, their thing was writing. You know, not necessarily. better behind a typewriter. Yeah, that's right. So here we are. I don't know where we are next in pictures. Uh, let's see here. So this is one of the first. Uh, Jill Bauman, who we met in 1978, um, uh, one of the first artists who's you know we became really friendly with. Uh, we started going to their studios um, when they would invite us. The way. You know, it, it, it's not like buying, as you say, like Beanie Babies or something from some dealer online. Uh, in those days, you actually met people. You went to their houses. You went to their studios. Um, you became friends, you know, just not just buying art from them. But Jill had a, uh, at the time, she was also ending up repping um, Walter Velez as an artist. And so she was like the, a crossover. She was a dealer and an artist. And in a strange way, I guess that influenced me later on becoming a dealer from being a collector. But uh, it, it also was true that I met other people who were like me, who I realized in an emerging, at the time, this was what we call an emerging collecting field. There were no auctions, no public auctions. Mm -hmm no way to buy or sell things except through photograph or slide. Okay. Um, everything was by mail, the correspondence or by telephone or in person. There was, there was no other way to do this and there were no dealers. So um, unless you knew the artist or, you know, a, a book dealer who had it, there were no actual art dealers of this kind. So I, I read somewhere that um, it's the experts the dealers because the more than anybody you know a real a really expert collector knows as much as a dealer i mean they invest themselves in the field and those for any of that really 
so many, I, I learned this later going to other kinds of conventions like uh, for depression class or things like that. But yes, it's the people who knew all about it. At first they become a dealer so they can upgrade the convention, their collections, right? That's, uh, that's definitely how it works <laughs> still to this day, right? right? Yeah. So you train up, you know, you're constantly trying to improve your collection this way. We never did that. We never sold. We never traded. So um, it wasn't for that purpose. But many, many collectors do that. They become dealers so they you know, feel they can sort of buy wholesale and if there is such right. a Right. Well, I mean, once you have a uh, sizable collection, and you want to continue to grow it, I mean, you kind of have to sell. So it, I can see why that happens, you know, why a collector becomes a quote unquote dealer because it just needs to happen. Correct. But I, I think most of the art dealers uh, that I know in comic art, you know, were collectors first. I mean, there might be one or two that mm -hmm. love the medium, you know, but saw the business opportunity and went after it that way before maybe they were uh, a collector. But yeah, I think most most dealers in our field are, collectors first right exactly so anyway uh so I, I only threw that in because i like chill and i think the next one if i'm not mistaken let's see yes so because of our association we ended up meeting a fellow by the name of roy torgerson who at the time was um working for zebra books back in the day zebra paperbacks uh, like mm -hmm. an art director or consultant and stuff like that and so through him we met people like Caldwell, and that was sort of our introduction bear in mind tsr and dungeons and dragons was just starting in 78 and just getting their group of artists together as part of their stable and so we became friends with clyde and we commissioned him to do this family portrait. This is our family portrait. I still um, have this one on the wall. Oh yes. Well, who would want this? But a member of the family. I mean, right. you know, I mean, come on. That's one of the things <laughs> with portraits, uh, which we which I continue to do. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the first iteration of this because it was Clyde. Um, I don't know if you know his work or not for a TSR. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, I mean, the first one had us all naked. <laughs> okay. And uh, so. You didn't I'm, ask for that? You didn't? <laughs> no, we did not. I was bare breasted. Well. Wow. Yes. And so were the children. And they complained. They were embarrassed. And so we had Clyde put us in clothes. That was our dog at the time, dressed up differently. Um, and so they, each, they ended up with some clothing. Including well, me. be careful what you ask for. <laughs> you you got to be specific sometimes, and, and we need to be close. Sure you should. He laughed. He laughed about it. He didn't <laughs> mind making the change. I said, "Come on, you know the kids. You know she, my youngest daughter, she was five years old. She was, you know, no, I'm not going to be, you know, no clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> right, because this is going on the wall. You know, the, you're going to have friends over. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, anyhow. Um, I think the next one, let's see what the next one is. Uh, let's see next here. Time. Yeah. So in 1978, we went to, I said, Bosscon, there we met Michael Whalen. And uh, he at that time was hosting his art as an amateur. This is before he went for a pro, you would say. Michael Whalen. And in those days, they sometimes had separations between professional and amateur artists. They dropped that designation um, because people complained, the artists complained, uh, that it was almost impossible to make that distinction sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but at that time they took it seriously. You either did it, or, you, you earned a living. A, a pro made his living doing illustration art, not a hobby. And an amateur did not or was on the way to being published. So this was the first piece that we ever got from Michael Wellen, $45. And it was a toss up. Uh, between this, and I believe it was a Charles Adams cartoon, which was also $50. And we chose Whalen. Wisely or not, I don't know. Um, I believe. Was the Charles Adams just a, uh, like a, was a strip art? Wasn't an Adams family type of no, piece? No, 
show from like you know New Yorker or something. Right. Yeah. You know, it was a, it was a published cartoon. I'd say it's yeah. they're they're probably worth the same amount today. Then, you know. Uh no, I, the last time I looked, the Adams were probably like three to four thousand, and I don't uh, think a whale, a whale in no? six by eight. A uh, thing like this unpublished would be, uh, you know, that much. But it doesn't matter. I see what you're I mean, saying. But it's early, though. It's early. It was early. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, something like five or six years ago, I gave it to Audrey as a gift. Uh, just gave, you know, I gave it back to her. I thought that she would right. like, she'd like to have it. That's nice of you. I to try to sell it. So I gave it back to her. Or him. <laughs> Both of them. Um, <laughs> As I said, we started going to Southern conventions. Um, we started the first Worldcon, I think it was 1977 that we went to uh, in Miami. Um, and we realized at that time there was also a very different um, vibe between Southern fandom and Northern fandom. Okay, Lunicons with their heavy, what can I say, bureaucracy and smoftum and bid sheets and setups and panel discussions and attracting all the best of the artists and the authors in the Northeast were distinctly different from Southern fandom, loose. Hi, let's all get together, go drinking. Let's, you know, uh, there, it, it, no, there was no orderliness to it, okay, sure. at all. Um, it was just good old boys, you know, all getting together, having a good time. Um, sure, you know, let's all have lunch. Uh, sure, you know, let's. But a whole different set of artists who are working in the South. Um, and this is how we met people like Alan Clark, uh, uh, the Lindons, um, trying Kevin Ward, um, and so on. But Alan Clark, especially, was important. Um, so we started buying, I've forgotten what order things are in, what's next. Um, but did you have a preference on style for the uh, shows in the north or the shows in the south? We did. This is Clark. Yeah. So we met him. We liked him. And then he ended up at a world con. There he was. And he said, yeah, I, you know, I've done a lot of work since then. You know, and he, we sat down with him because now we're sort of sort of friends. He said, let me show you my portfolio. So he opened up his portfolio. We said, we really like this idea. What is this? He says, I call it half scared. Half scared. It's when you don't really, I said, what does that mean? He said, well, you know, it's when you see uh, a farmlands and a fence in the distance and there's stuff that's been caught in the fence and the barbed wire and there's cows. I said, huh? You know, what have we ever been? We've never been to a farm with cows and barbed wire. Right. But the idea intrigued us, you know, this is Southern, right? Mm -hmm. uh, more, what can I say? Uh, rural, rural fantasy. And so we said, yeah, I can see how paper and flotsam and stuff like Jetson get caught up in the fence and it looks scary from a distance. Maybe you stuck. So we'll get that. Ain't that for us. And so that was half scared. And we knew it. He was creating what he called the Deadwood series, which I think is the next one. Did four or five of these. They were really unusual because he had a, a way of hiding things in plain sight, like the skeleton on the left and the stuck stuff in the tree and all of it really dark, really dark. And we loved that. I mean, he had dark Southern Gothic sensibility. That was so, it, yes, different from the north, very different. A lot more, um, best horror, okay. And he went on to doing a tremendous amount of horror, you know. So, we bought them, we started talking other people into buying them, <laughs> and yeah, uh, by the mid 80s, um, we were really pouring it on, you might say. And we moved to DC from New York to Washington, DC. And almost immediately we realized it was a, a for the first time there was a, an actual gallery uh, in the DC area called Pendragon Gallery. We started buying from them. Um, and so on. 
and just con both we started dating all people who lived in the Washington DC area in the same way we did for the New York area. And to our surprise, we just made friends you know, with people that, you know, still know to this day who run PhilCon and all these conventions. Mm -hmm. Um, we met in 1985, um, Kelly Fries, who was then living in the DC area. And so there were actually, uh, Steve Hinn lived in Alexandria, Virginia at the time. He visited us and showed his portfolio. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, so there were some main, uh, then he subsequently moved to Red Hook, you know, didn't stay in Alexandria, but that sort of set things up, you know, for knowing him for 40 years. Um, and Kelly Freeze too. So uh, we, whom we would then meet at conventions from time to time. Um, we started buying. 1986, I had the 44th World Con in Atlanta. We bought Richard Corbin, Tom Kidd, Barkley Shaw, JL, John Logendorfer, Richard Powers, Mark Rogers. You know, people by that time, well, at that time, you could buy just about any cover art between three hundred six hundred dollars. That was a going. I'd love to see but the listen, Corbin. Yeah, Corbin's gone. Yep. But yeah. 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 Under that amount, all for all those things, and we see right. the Franks come. At first, they didn't want to take our check. You know, they said, "I don't know. Do we want to do that or not?" After a couple of conventions, they say, "Here come the Franks." <laughs> Oh boy, oh boy. You know, we're gonna, we go home with 15, 20 paintings. Right. Yeah. Well, it was like, you know, it was, I mean, you were good patrons of the art. They they knew, you know, they knew to look for you. It wouldn't have been a good show That's if you didn't right. show up. So they saw us yeah. coming. And, you know, they, wow. And we had such a good time. I mean, to buying all of that and framing all of those and just, I don't know, we filled our house with them, you know? Mm hmm. 88. Uh, Nola Khan in New Orleans. I bought David Sherry, David Manley, J.K. Potter. Couldn't get enough of Jeff Potter. Uh, again, you know, Southern, you know, Louisiana horror. I don't know if you're familiar with Jeff Potter's work. I'm not familiar with, but, but, um, photo, but I've, photo I've got a tab I'm opening stuff up, uh, you know, up so I can search it later. <laughs> you, well, J.K. Potter. All right. Got a couple of art books uh, to his name, so look for them. And it was the basis when I went into business, by the way, all these friendships that I had made with the artists. When, so when I finally decided I'm a dealer, I called them up and said, hey, you know, how would you like to have me sell your art? So in 1989, let's see if what the next one is. Let's see if it's what I'm thinking it is. Yep, uh, The War Made of Mars. So at a convention, we see Kelly Freeze, and he's got these two paintings. He's saying, why on earth, Kelly, do you have two paintings by Alan Anderson? Um, Planet Stories from 1952. And he said, well, here's the story. He said, Fiction House went out of business. He published his art. And he got back most of his, uh, his uh, art uh, before the place burned down. But then it burned down. And they owed him money, and oh, they no. still had a couple of paintings. So, in, so he traded what they owed him because they had no more money for these two paintings. This is 1989, and he said, "Yeah, I want $5,000 each for them," which at the time was a hell of a lot of money. And Kelly always wanted a lot of money for his own art too, but this was like, oh my god, and so because I had to do it, I had to negotiate. So I got two for nine. Mm -hmm. I got him to take off. <laughs> he took off, but for Jane, he took off $500. And Howard said, are you sure you want, we want to do that? I said, absolutely. You got to have these. Just had to have it. I don't so know. did you guys ever uh, cancel each other out where you both, you couldn't decide on a piece and so you just walked away from it? Well, yeah, well, interestingly, we decided on this strategy that if we both, but well, we had a budget for things that we loved individually. If we both loved it and we could afford it, we bought it. If one of us actually hated it, we would not buy it. But if one of us was sort of lukewarm and the other one was really crazy for it, 
we would buy it. And we had we gave each other permission at the beginning that anything up to five hundred dollars you could buy without permission. If you saw it and you loved it, you could buy it. Anything over that, you had to talk to each other about right. it. In time, that went up to a thousand. Okay, the <laughs> the limit. <laughs> Uh, but we never fought over things. So mm. this it was out of a moot kind of point. I mean, he, he might grimace like over something like this. But in time, he said, you know, obviously, that was a good move, right? I mean, the painting was clearly worth more mm -hmm. uh, time. But there was something about it that said, it called to me and said, you know, you've got to have this, you know, opportunities to do this. And at the time, I didn't know this, but I learned that there were only maybe two or three known Alan Anderson science fiction paintings in existence for a while it was only these two this one and the other one we got from her sargasso of lost cities i think uh, of lost worlds uh and i think doug ellis came up with another one so i mean in the in the entire world there's only two or three alan anderson science fiction paintings because they burnt to the ground well in this one uh when you did sell it in heritage it we were uh, what did it get to thirty eight thousand eight hundred dollars in 2008 yep. so yeah that was a good buy yeah. A goodbye. Yes, I would say that in our collection, and we'll we'll get to the time when we're you know talking about the auctions. But, and I tell people too that we don't have crystal balls. We can only develop our eye and our taste, and then when the time comes, it's going to be the eighty twenty rule. Twenty percent of your collection is going to be worth the, all the other eighty percent. Mm -hmm. Just don't know which twenty percent that's going to be. But it, but that's the way it works out. So plenty of the paintings that we bought sold either what we paid for them or below what we paid for them. But 20% were golden like this and made up for all the rest. And that's the way a large collection is. It's not necessarily true for those people who only collect one artist. I mean, I, I've met those people who only collect, um, oh, I don't know. I'm making this up here, Ditko for, mm -hmm. for, for comic art. Sure. Or only Wrightson. You know, I mean, oh, you know, only this or only that, right? And you build a major collection of that, but it's it's hard to forecast what's going to happen when the time comes to sell it. And, you know, it's like it's like buying a you know, an index fund. You know, you can throw all your money into one stock and lose your shirt. You could get lucky if it's Amazon, right, or Apple. But the safest approach to buy you know across the board diversify huh? <laughs> which, which you did you diversified your collection correct right yeah but you can't know which ones are going to be more valuable you can only buy what you like well exactly. look you know things have changed since we started collecting people don't buy for that reason anymore in about 2008 things changed uh, there was a sea change actually with the recession in 2008 mm -hmm. and all of a sudden people were buying for investment and not for love, unless they could be guaranteed, unless it was vetted art, unless they could make a profit or at least the things would retain its value, they, they were not willing to take a chance anymore. And by that time it was already no longer really an emerging collectible thanks to Heritage and others who had started auctions in the late nineties. By that time it was really getting established. Illustration art like comic art was, it was a known commodity. So, Anyway, moving on. Um, so this represents a piece that represents the time when I went into business. So 1990 Worldcon was in The Hague in the Netherlands. And it was at that point I decided, that, you know, I'd already started making sort of deals. You know, people would come to our house um friends and they say oh well look at that um i really like that how can i how could i get something like that and i started dealing not making any money but i would be sending let's say barkley shaw for example i'm going to use him he did a piece that featured like a, a dentist or something like or teeth or something and as a dentist who came to our house and said oh i i didn't know i could for crazy reasons buy such a thing so i started sending slides from artists to people who are not collectors and selling for them, but not making any commission. I was just doing them favors. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that, you know, by that time, uh, 
I had just finished, I just graduated in 1990 from Georgetown and I was looking for a job and I didn't want to go back to the job I had in New York, which was working for a, uh, an automated service bureau. At, at one point, like ADP, I was working for Bank of America, you know, things like payroll and um, products like that. And I said, I'll be, you know, I don't want to work for, you know, similar kinds of uh, companies down in Washington, DC. So when I got my PhD, I said, I started, where am I going to, there were no job openings. I started teaching part-time um, at American University, but there was no full-time positions. I said, what am I going to do? So I said, well, let's see. I know about the art. I like to sell things, right? I don't want to sell light bulbs or real estate or fertilizer. If I'm going to sell something, let's sell something that I can really get behind. I mm -hmm. knew editors, I knew the publishers, I knew the authors. I, I had everything except for customers, as a matter of fact. I had everything but customers. And I said, okay, on the way over to the Netherlands in the airplane, I decided to go into business. I spent the six hours in the plane thinking of what name I should have. It had to be simple, sort of indicate what I was going to do, but not give the entire thing away, not be too esoteric, uh, shortened to something that would be cute. Worlds of wonder. Wow, that'll work. Only problem was that Michael Whalen had just published a couple of works of wonder and wonder works, his art books. And I said, oh my God, okay, we're gonna get to you. So the first thing I did when I get back, by the way, I called, called Mike and I said, by the way, I'm going into business with this name. Don't worry about it. Anyway, I decided this would be the first time I'd be able to meet Jim Burns. And mm. other artists, British artists, who were all going to the Worldcon there, right? Oh, Great yeah. idea. Love Burns work, yeah. Yeah. So after we landed, there happened to be a shopping mall next to the hotel. And interestingly, they had a machine there that produced business cards for $5. You could punch out 50 business cards. So I went into business. I punched out the 50 business cards saying Worlds of Wonder. And I started handing them out. And Jim Burns, he said, wow, we love Illustrated Man. We want it. He says, well, I can't sell it to you. I said, why not? He says, well, it's going to the Society Illustrators for a year in their traveling exhibit. I said, we'll wait a year. No problem. We waited a year. And Society of Illustrators then shipped it to us from New York. So that was the first piece we bought from Jim Burns. And then I, and many others we bought over time. Um, and that was one of the things that probably every collector does this. It's interesting that when you really like somebody's work, you end up buying more than one. They're like potato chips. So as a result, by the time we turned around, we owned, I don't know, a dozen John Berkeys, uh, you know, uh, eight Jim Burns, um, uh, a dozen Gary Rudell, uh, you know, just F Clyde Caldwell. And so we had like a, almost a history of their career, you know, from the time we started buying their art till we finished, their style changed, it became different, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a historical record that we had of their artistic career. But this is the first one I still have it. Oh, that's nice, you kept it, that's great. Oh yeah, well, yeah, I still have a couple. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. Was at this convention, you know, and others that we ended up, you know, meeting Chris Moore and Steve Crisp and John Harrison, you know, um, uh, just a lot of the British artists that never would come to the States. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're at the World Cons over there. Um, so skip forward, 1991. Let's see if that's next. Yes. And so we also loved Richard Powers. And so in 1991, we went to the World Con in Chicago and, and there was his display. And this was like a, a, on a piece of cardboard, I'm gonna say one inch by three inch photograph surrounded by other hand painted things, a Pentateuch he called it, you know, a five piece, you know, that he envisioned painting. And he only had this one in the center that he had actually finished. And other things that, uh, that he had up there, just photographs of the work, not the actual work. And he was nowhere to be found. You know, he was a guest of honor. So we said, where is he? He's got to be here, right? And at that point, we, we knew, I don't know, Dave Hartwell pretty well. 
He says, oh, he's up in his hotel room. He's doodling. So we, <laughs> wow, you have to meet Richard Powers. You have to get us an introduction. So he led us up to his hotel room. We walk in and sure enough, he's sitting cross-legged on his bed, mounds of paper, and he's scribbling with a pencils and crayons, you know, and drawing. No interest whatsoever in attending the convention. So we said, we're interested in this piece. He says, oh yeah, okay, I'll deliver it to you. Two, three months later, <laughs> he tries to deliver it to us. And he's supposed to arrive at our house at like three o'clock in the afternoon in Washington, D.C., in Georgetown. And, you know, this is before cell phones, you know. So, you know, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock comes, five o'clock. We're really getting worried, right? Finally, he shows up. He said, I got lost. He said, the 495 Beltway goes all around the you know, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Exits. He said, they wouldn't let me off. I couldn't get off on the exits. They they were rude. You know, the cars wouldn't let me exit. <laughs> so he went around the entire beltway. It takes an hour to get around the beltway. If you miss your exit, mm -hmm. you are stuck, you know, unless you know how to backtrack, which he didn't. He was coming from Connecticut. He was he was frustrated. That's for the last time he handled, you know, hand delivered an artwork. <laughs> hand delivered an artwork. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. It was big. It was big. And that was the beginning of our association with Richard Powers and visiting him in Connecticut too. Yeah. And me ending up doing an art book. And so we were still buying other stuff. Um, the year before Jerry Dilley died, um, he called us and said, I'm dying. I'm not, I haven't got long to live. And how would you like to buy a lot of art? He said, okay. Sure. He says, okay, come up. He says, just bring a lot of moolah. And I said, moolah? Like <laughs> cash? He says, yeah, the greenbacks, the cabbage, the cash. I said, okay. So we went to the bank. We got a lot of money in cash. We felt like rob robbers, you know, like in the movies with a, with a golf bag, you know, a sports bag filled with $100, bundles of $100 bills. And we go to his house. And we proceed to buy a lot of art. And this was one of them, Virgil Finley. But we bought a lot of art uh, at that time. And <laughs> when the word got out that we had done this, you know, other collectors called us and said, we call Jerry. He says, he's not selling. He says, you got there first. How did you do that? I said, we didn't do anything. He called us, you know, we just, uh, and we went. You know, mm -hmm. I did. And um, yeah, the only thing we left behind there, which Helen may still have, are a lot of, he had a lot of um, Finley black and whites. The only one person I ever saw with more of them would be Bob Weinberg. And I think Phyllis still has a lot of them. But anyway, so we traveled to Saddle River, New Jersey, and came away with a large horde of paintings. And which brings us to the next piece. We realized at some point in time that a book um, that had been written called Over My Shoulder, okay, written and published in 1983 that we had on our shelves um, actually represented a painting by Hannes Bach. It was about four foot by seven foot and it was hanging here um displayed at the associated fantasy publishers display at the book festival museum of science and industry radio city new york in 1948. so the independent publishers at the day arkham avalon you can see the fpci gnome etc uh prime shasta uh all pitched in to have a table because they couldn't afford it as indie off you know publishers mm -hmm. pitched in to have a table uh, to advertise and they and they literally commissioned Bach to do this mural that hung behind the display and by happenstance we remember that Jerry DeLarie happened to have over his desk covered with cigar smoke the piece of the thing on the left that image that you see on the left mm -hmm. as that's the next piece um, the next thing so through time 
word got out that we had this and Jack Gonzalez, who was a, a book dealer, he knew somebody in upstate New York who had two other pieces, uh, the one on the top and the one on the right that belonged to this mural. So we ended up with all three pieces. As you can see, what Bach did, if you will look, he cut the mural apart, saving what he considered to be the important pieces with the creatures <laughs> and just threw out the rest. He came, he came, the word has it that we learned from, um, who was it who came to visit? Marty Greenberg came to visit and said, they believed that he took it away in his car. You know, he carried it away somehow where they had it delivered to him, but then he chopped it up. He sawed it, he sawed it apart and kept, it was on Masonite. Wow. So he ended up with just those three pieces and I, we believe that the rest was just, just discarded. But then around this period of time, after living in, in DC for a while, of course we had to get to know a restorer. And that restorer was very helpful. She had someone who worked for her who put together, we said, we want to recreate the mural, but we don't want to, it to look as if we tried to actually make a fake, like a forgery. So I decided to make it the way uh, restorers treat uh, Greek and Roman pottery. They assemble the pieces, but they don't make any attempt to make it all look real. They fill in the blank spots with just black or gray pottery, and they leave what was original, but they restore it. Mm -hmm. So you see pots with fragments, and the rest is just black, okay? So we dec I decided that that's what I would do with this and make the mural, recreate it to size, which we judged from the photograph, what the size was, based on the table that was in front, and hired this guy to put it together. And uh, the funny thing is that when we finally, when we moved and we decided to downsize, this piece was uh, six by eight, okay? Right. It was big. I mean, try to imagine that filled an entire wall, right? Mural. And we said <laughs> at Heritage, I believe having a conversation with Todd Ignite, I think, or Ed Jaster at the time, and he said, this will never sell. <laughs> You know, I said, well, we paid, you know, the equivalent of something like two or four, something, something we have about $11,000 in it at this point of just buying the pieces and repaying $2,000 or whatever we did for the restoration. You know, he says, I don't know if it's ever going to sell. They were amazed when a phone bidder actually bought it. I think it was for 11. Yeah. Well, that's not bad. No. Nope. No, we got out, you know, and somebody has a wonderful thing, you mm -hmm. know, a wonderful historical thing. But they were surprised. They said that's how it's unpredictable. That's how auctions are, you know, totally unpredictable that way, really. Um, anyway, um, it was really, if it were not for us looking at that book and finding that page with that photograph from 1948, we never would have known that the piece on the left um would be, you know, Gizelstein. Uh, we, we named these pieces, by the way. So, no, I think that's wonderful, though. I mean, you know, and I think the way you approached restoring it is great, too. I mean, not to try to recreate the piece, but uh, well, at least sometimes, you know, it, it's a um, what's it called? It's a and it sort of an uh, I the way I look at it, actually, which is if we ever talk about how we downsize collections and so on, is that I, I consider these things artifacts of culture. And it's up to us to preserve them as best we can. So it's true. A lot of the stuff, a lot of the pulp art is beaten up. It was mistreated at the time. It's flaking. The, the media that was used was poor. Artists didn't really care about permanence. They never did. Illustrators painted for the nonce, you know, to to get the damn thing photographed and published. They mm -hmm. didn't use the best of materials or fancy, you know, canvas. Uh, and so a lot of the times you had to put money in, you know, to reline things, to in-paint, to uh, stabilize the, the the crazing, you know, the the lines that you see, you know, when I'm talking about the crackler oh, yeah. that you see in, in, in older paintings, you have to put the money in. You know, if you don't, in another 20 years, it's all going to fall right off the canvas. So, you, you know, you put it in. You you 
do that so that it can last at least another generation. And it goes like that, turning over another generation, another generation. And by now the pulp arts, you know, it's now close to a hundred years old. How long will it last? Oh, do people take care of it? You know, um, there are books, you know, a couple hundred years old that are better shape than certainly books that were published in 1950. It's true. You know, we talk about that a lot as, you know, as collectors, you're caretakers of the artwork for the next generation. So you got to take care of them. And sometimes that means putting in restoration that maybe doesn't feel, you know, you're not, you, you weren't prepared to spend, but if you, uh, you want to guarantee that the piece is going to be around. But uh, it's, you, it's, you it's a, it. it's a, it's a judgment call. It's really tough when it comes to paper, because what do you do with acid, non-acid free paper? I right. mean, you can stabilize it, dip it, spray it, but it changes the color of the paper. And so you sort of exchanging what looks to you to be nice and white for now becomes an, you know, a tan, a, a cream, let's put it that way, you know, bordering on beige color paper, but now acid free. Right. So it's a trade off that way because otherwise it's just going to, if you've ever seen old folk, you know, magazines or comic books that have started to what that are brown and brittle. It's sad. It's really sad. No, I have. I've seen them both. Oh yeah, it's, it's not. It's not good. It's not good. Um, anyway, um, what's next? Um, Let's see. Ah uh, yes. At this point in time, we started buying from places like Illustration House in New York. Uh, Walt and Roger Reed, the Reeds, um, and and after that, from in recent years, Fred Tarabas, who started, who worked for them during this period of time. I don't know if you know Fred or not. I do not. Okay, uh, he specializes in in uh, American illustration, American illustrators, but not contemporary. And so, Illustration House had this, and we were introduced to Macaulay. We started falling in love with Harold Macaulay. And the toffee girl and this is mr yellow jacket and there were we're still being educated remember this is like a, a 40 50 year process of of learning about things so we bought this from illustration house after negotiating for ten thousand five hundred dollars and this is in um when was this night beginning of the 1990s or so 1992 and after the sale, we get a call from a book dealer in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, whose name I have forgotten actually, wanting to know how much we paid for it. Because he was the person who sold it to Illustration House, who sold it to us. And so we said, oh, well, we paid 10.5. And he said, oh, I sold it to them for 4,500. And said, oh, oh gosh, well, they, you know, are you unhappy about this? He said, no, not really, not at all, because I bought it from a picker for $75. <laughs> he said, oh, my God, you know, this is the, the food chain at the time. At the time, you could go to garage sales, estate sales, um, places you would never suspect and have pulp art. It was considered crappy art, sometimes in lousy condition, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly framed. It was $75 for the Again, I still have that because I liked it anyway. Um, next, remember I said the restorer that we knew. Uh, and so we, this is not, I, I, I didn't have a good piece of this. this is why it's showing heritage, but okay, we can cut that out. Um, thank you. I actually went and grabbed this one because you had that one uh, photo of it on the wall and it was a little smaller. So I thought it would be better to grab. An image right, here, right. I didn't have a good photo of this. I mean, I do have a slide of it somewhere, or, or a four by five transparency, but I, I, I no longer have the gizmo on my printer that allows me to take. For for a period of time, they they sold these attachments to printers where you could actually convert slides and four by five transparencies, mm -hmm. and even eight by tens, into JPEGs. Right. Yeah, and they discontinued that HP. Yeah, that was a good gizmo. Anyway. So the restorer, I went in and we see this huge piece. And I don't know if, if the next one is, uh, I don't think I'm showing it here, but it's a lunar landscape by, by, by Bonestell. And she said it has some damage on the 
top corner that I'm restoring, and I know Fred Durant wants to sell it. I said, we'll buy it. <laughs> and this is how we got to know Fred Durant, who was instrumental in developing all the major displays, spearheading uh, all the historic spaceship uh, for, for the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. He's a very well-known person. And he lived in the D.C. area, so we went to visit him. And he had, among all of his art, Bonestell and Peshek. I mean, so it was a whole other sort of aspect of science fiction art. We had never really considered these kinds of early space paintings and space exploration as being, it was a, another segment, you might say, of collecting, mm -hmm. you know, Bonestella, things that appeared in Life magazine and Collier's at the beginning, you know, in the 50s. So this was one of the first one we bought, which was a major one. We learned later on that this is one of eight that he painted. Bonestell was obsessed with certain images and he painted eight of these identical. I mean, identical. try to happen, okay? Yeah, so it's Saturn seen from Titan, hmm. the moon of Titan. And, was, and so people have made it um same so, size though same I mean, same same oh no really? same 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 painting wow a, a, more or less i mean you can tell them apart because they're not identical right, right? I mean, okay. no artist can really paint the identical thing so in some you know the water's a little different the rocks are a little different you know but the same saturn is the same painting you know mm -hmm. and so we learned later that this was the same as the plate in Conquest of Space, which was a book, you know, from uh, the 1950s and 1952. And that this was the one that he painted and gave to his daughter. I mean, the history of these things uh, from, from I forgot his first name, Schutz, who did the book on Bonestell, who was, a, I mean, he's a guru. I mean, he knew everything about anything about Bonestell. And so he said, sure, that's the one, you know, that he gave to his daughter. <laughs> okay. Um, and we were just fascinated by these kinds of stories. You know, the fact that if people would know this, you know, we wrote it down, we put it in a database. He said, we have to remember this. We have to remember these kinds of things, you know, otherwise who will ever know that this was the one that he gave to his daughter, Jane Webster, right, now DC. Mm. Anyway, so we bought the lunar landscape, which we then learned was the maquette for a 40 foot by eight foot mural to hang in the Hayden, the Boston Planetarium for years, and then was given to the Smithsonian, and only recently was refurbished. I think they're gonna hang it somewhere. Um, but the, I saw the unveiling of it. I went to the unveiling, I was invited to a special. Wow. It was really fascinating. Really cool. It would look like a carpet, okay? It's, this carpet that was eight foot across, and then they unra unraveled it, you know? And there it was, 40 feet. You know, all, uh, Ron Miller was there. Uh, my restorer was there. I'm trying to think of, you know, people who were invited. Fred was there. A, a, a marvel. And and we see a whole chunk cut out. Like, oh yeah, that's where the air conditioner was. <laughs> what? Yeah, they were hanging it, you know? and. They had to make room for the things on the wall. So they cut out the painting. Anyway, it was cracking. It was in lousy shape. It was stored in the bowels of the Smithsonian for you know 30 years. And they said, we need to get together and raise money. And so how much do you think it's gonna to take to do? Well, they we all stood around and said, hmm. Okay, we decided it probably cost about 150,000 to restore this mural. We had no money like that, you know. Who were going to do that? You know, who would be the benefactor for that? But eventually they got it done. I heard. Oh, that's yeah, great. Finally did it. Anyway, but that's Bonestell. And then we ended up sending the lunar landscape to uh, the opening exhibit at the Science Fiction Museum, Paul Allen's in Seattle, Washington. So it got around. We used to do that. We'd loan our art to anybody who would ask because. Who's going to see it otherwise in person? It's not like they were museums that had this mm -hmm. kind of art, unless you were especially invited to somebody's house. 
and you got to see it, which is why people say, oh, we're invited to the Franks. You know, it's, it's like the Frank Museum, right? You never saw this art in person. You never saw it in person. So we decided we would loan it if the Society of Illustrators said they wanted it, if a traveling road, anybody had a traveling show, um, if artists wanted it back for their own, you know, purposes to show off. Uh, very often we would allow them to do that. Like I mentioned Steve Hickman before, mm -hmm. uh, he, did, he did commissions, he did paintings for us. And he said, it's done, but I can't give it to you. I want to take it around to Phil Kahn and Luna Khan. I want to show it off for a year or six months, right? And after sure, sure. to show what I can do. And we'll say, okay, you know, do that. Let other people see it. That's true though. I mean, if uh, like if a Hickman commission didn't get uh, to go with them, it almost would never get seen again. I mean, how no. there's just no place to show that kind of work, unfortunately. No, no. no. And that's still the case for mm -hmm. a lot of art. Um, in fact, I had the idea about half a dozen years ago um, after getting Christmas cards every year from artists who did special cards. Uh, I don't know if this is something that comic artists do, but it's a tradition in for illustrators, many of them, um, Tom Kidd, Bless Edwards, JL back in the day, Jill, you know, they on their on their special lists, they would make a special painting just for Christmas, for the holiday, and send it, and make cards and send it. If you were not on that list, you would never see this art. So I decided, wouldn't it be great to just have a Christmas card book? You know, a, a coffee table sized book with just Christmas, you know, holiday art. That artists have done because yeah. otherwise no one would ever see it yeah no and uh once that happens a lot on the arts artist side but there are a number of collectors that commission comic artists to do their annual christmas cards yes and so those go around a lot and those are fun i mean yeah. it's it, you're patronizing an artist and you're getting something unique out there to to your friends who aren't you know in many cases familiar with what you know this, this about we the hobby or the artist do exactly the same thing we commission it Mm -hmm. To a local printer in in Port Washington, until the final year, after about four or five years of the, the printer said, "I'm sorry, I can't do this for you. It's too risque." <laughs> well, you know that does happen. <laughs> too risque. It's too weird. Uh, you know, <laughs> last year was bad enough, but now you got these these crazy aliens doing you know stupid stuff, and no, nope, I'm not doing it. <laughs> They have uh, their limits. Well, then, and they're allowed to say no if they really want to. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny, but we did the same thing, you know, sending out the cards and sure. doing stuff like that. Anyway, we had a good time. Um, by this time, we, as I said, we mentioned uh, Jerry Wiest and Joe Manorino. So mm -hmm. uh, we became good friends with Jerry, and Jerry started representing estates and selling art. And so that's, I think that's the next one. So we had examples of, you know, like Frank R. Paul, Finley, Bach all the well-known artists of the time, we had at least a half a dozen examples. I kept this one because the pose, I can't tell you the number of paintings I have seen with this pose, the very same pose of the damsel in distress or the, you know, typically, but in this position being carried by something, it could be a robot, it could be a caveman, it could be anything. In this case, it's a large red chicken, but it could be anything carrying a woman this way. It's an interesting pose. Anyway, this is Abduction by Big Red. <laughs> Appropriately named. Yes. Uh, but no, I mean, I love the imagery. I mean, and again, it's I uh, love the color palette choices on this thing. I mean, it's it's yeah, garish, yeah. but it's it's beautiful. Uh, I well, love he it. He was famous, you know, for doing these tiny little critters, sometimes little people marching around you see the little tiny creatures like little chickens uh but he had paintings that were like this with massive gizmos uh, machinery in the background like this um you know it was a style that he sort of known for you can find other paintings that are very similar to this is what i'm saying and, yeah, rick, uh, rick welch mentions that uh, the, the, the female's pose was used a lot in tarzan or king kong too. yeah and so it's just a popular but this one i but in my notes saying i bought this from jerry at the time, he was in 1996. He was still working for Sotheby's as a consultant, and he told us it came from the Walheim estate. Interesting. Of, of science fiction. Yeah. Yeah. So, so started over the years and buying from Jerry personally. Um, next. Let's see. So, 
we met Lisa Snellings, I think at the second or first world horror convention. And I was taken by her work. Um, she was showing off a carousel, which is in the background here, that thing, correct? And she had a vision, you know, she was going to make a dark carnival. And I said, I can get behind that. And so for 10 years, we essentially bought and, can, you know, how can I say, was re were responsible for the dark carnival, which ended up being approximately 10, 11 pieces, all kinetic, moving pieces, including the Ferris wheel then in the front and the ticket taker, which you see sort of in the, on the left there. And you can't see, really see it, but there was a roller coaster at some point. This is our basement. This is a, this roll, this ticket taker was about six foot tall and he spewed uh, tickets. When you pressed a button, out came a ticket to the amusement park, to the dark carnival with our name on it. That ticket <laughs> made. So people who visited could have, get a ticket to the show. And all of these things moved. The Ferris wheel, you know, turned around. The, the, uh, uh, all of them were movable, kinetic. The roller coaster had a cart that went around and around. was about four foot by six foot and about four foot high. And then came the time when we downsized and had to move from this house. This is the McLean house. And we ended up giving the entire carnival to the Visionary Museum in Baltimore. I thought, what are the chances of finding someone who would buy these pieces from us individually? They were large, you know? Right. And we wanted to keep it together, which was another problem. And so the only way to do that was to give it uh, to a museum. And so that's what we did. And that was the Visionary Museum. I don't know if they still have it, but all the pieces went there. Well, these were uh, conversation pieces. Oh, absolutely. Sure fact, when you had friends over. The, at the time in 1998, Buccaneer was a world con held in Baltimore. And I don't know if this is the first time. I think this is the first time they we were invited to make a display. And we brought all the dark carnival in. I rented a U-Haul huge truck and Jim Burns had flown over for this and a couple of other artists and none of them wanted to drive this truck to Baltimore. <laughs> the 16 foot U-Haul, it was automatic. I had never done such a thing before. I said, somebody has to get it there. So you drove? I drove it. <laughs> yeah. I drove it to the loading dock. I was scared to death. I mean, I had never driven a truck in my life. Um, Lisa sat, sat next to me. She wrote shotgun. She took a picture of me. I think I still have it somewhere of me, you know, behind the wheel. I was scared. I mean, everybody put their art in it. Jim, everybody who was displaying there um, loaded the truck with their art. I had like $100,000 worth of art in this U-Haul. I'm going to up, you know, from the 495 to the 95 an hour to Baltimore. It was scary. It was scary. But I did it. And we and we showed off uh, the dark carnival at Buccaneer, and that was that was fun. So it was worthwhile doing. Well, it's, uh... this, leads me, this leads me to um, com when we talk about commissions. So we bought this beautiful house, which I'll show you a picture of in a, in a slide or two. But we decided that it was a very modern 1950s art modern type of house with glass bricks and it looked like a ranch house when you drove up to it like one story but it was not it was cavernous it looked like an airplane hangar when you walked into it huge open space and the only way to have fun is to have one of those rooms be the haggard room so we decided to have some fun and made one of the rooms in the style of 1880 to 1905 let's say 1910 that haggard would be comfortable in a drawing room. And that's what we did. So all the furniture, the bookcases, and then we started commissioning artists for the Haggard project. It took about three years to do this. And there's Donato Triptych over the sofa. Yeah. Pickman, not of the lily next to it. And uh, a little piece we bought in England, the Hotter and Staunton cover. Uh, and so we, we commissioned. Um, Bob Eggleton and Jeff Jones, um, Gary Rudell, uh, 
uh, Ian Miller, who did The Brethren, um, a whole bunch of artists. Uh, Don Mates did King Solomon's Mines. Um, it was tricky. Some of the artists we approached, uh, well known, that whose name I will not mention, um, could not paint other than an illustration. They were not able to just read the book and create something that was based on the book. We gave them each the book, by the way, to mm -hmm. read. Not all of them were familiar, but we picked our favorite, and then we picked the artist who we thought would do the best job with that book. And some just couldn't do other than a book illustration. You know, they laid it out as if it had a title, a spine, the ISBN number bottom left, you know, they, the blurb on the back, you know, they, they laid it out as a composition. And we said, no, it doesn't have to do that. At the most, we're ever going to make a calendar out of these, you know, uh, but we're not going to publish them. You know, they're not going to be book covers. If you want to, you can, you know, they have the copyright. But mm -hmm. um, so some of them never made it. And we decided we'd pay everybody the same price also, which we sort of stuck to. <laughs> Unfortunately, some we couldn't. We had to pay more. But Mike, so Mike Whale and, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, and, there's. Yeah. Got more. Understandable. And others, and others like Jeff Jones said, uh, we asked everybody to send us a prelim, you know, a, a study. Mm -hmm. Give us a choice of what you're doing. Three months go by, I call, I, I talk to Jeff. I said, so? He says, the painting's done. I said, the painting's done? We haven't seen it. He says, take it or leave it. If you don't want it, I'll just sell it to somebody else. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, we want it. We want it. And we had said to just about everybody, we're paying $7,500 a person for their art. He said, give me $3,500 for it. I said, no, I'm giving you $7,500. He says, no, that's too much. You know, there's more like, I'm happy with $3,500. I said, Jeff, we don't want anyone to feel like they got more or less than somebody else. So we're paying just everybody the same, you know? So he grudgingly took our money. <laughs> were, you, were you happy with the work? Yes, we're happy with the work, but it was a surprise. Because he didn't give you the prelim. Well, we wanted to see what was coming. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, yeah. I mean, by that time we were pretty, you know, we wanted to, everybody else did it. We couldn't figure out, you know, why he would be balking at this. But we said, at that point, we we're so glad to get something from Jeff Jones. And we said, what that, how bad could it be? Right? Right. That is worst. He'd be better than anybody else, so, you know. So we'll take whatever. Well, he was very confident. That's why you know he was like, "I'll sell it to somebody else," and it's true. I think back in, back in that time period, I mean, he his paintings were pretty sought after, and uh, he wouldn't have had any problem probably selling it to somebody else. That's right. That's right. And and we knew it, so he said, "Okay, we'll take it." You know. Anyway, this triptych, Eric Bright Eyes, we decided when Dana Dan Giancola showed us again studies we fell in love with two the, the centerpiece is 30 by 40 by the way to give you an idea of the size of this it's like uh, 30 by by 65 it's huge it's big um but we fell in love with two images that were in the center that would have been the center picture so we said we'll paint them both we'll take them both and we had the idea that we would swap them out from time to time that we'd make the the, you know, the triptych a, a different in the middle, but then it arrived and he had framed it already and permanently affixed them on this wooden frame that it takes two people to lift right, and, and put on the wall. <laughs> and so that was the end of that idea. So we still have, I still have the other painting that was the center piece, but this, uh, but Eric Bright Eyes um, is a, is a um, really good story. By Haggard, uh, if he he fell in love with two women, the good witch and the bad witch. Ah. Uh, so yeah, I bet you can tell which one is which. I can, but you know what? I, I'm more intrigued by the fact that uh, you're close enough to Donato that you can call him Dan. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's so. Uh, that's that's great. No, nope, I've never heard anybody call him Dan before. That, uh, but well, no, this is beautiful. I love I love his work. I mean, if you want to see it in person, and that's the great thing about going to IX is you know you get to see at least a dozen of his paintings up close, 
uh, every yes. show since he's he's there and he's yeah really he's really amazing uh, and incredibly uh, generous and 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 outgoing and, and and just fun to talk to as well. I mean, I that's right. Yeah, that's, he's just just wonderful. Yeah, great artist and and does wonderful mythological uh, Tolkien like scenes. I mean, he's just there's no one better at doing that. He's really good. Yeah. So where are we next? Uh, uh, where are we next? I think another photo. Well, I'm gonna I think coming up is actually what the house looked like. There we yes. go. So this was the view from the living room looking up. That's the stairs down to our living room, our dining room. Our dining that's, room table. It's a pretty uh, amazing space up there. Yes, it was. It was an amazing house. It, We bought it because our house in Georgetown got too small for us at 4,500 square feet. So you we need had, a room for the art. So we bought this one in McLean. 8,000 square feet, and then they got a little too small because even though it was bigger in total size, you can't see this, but one side of this house is all window. So it was only really gave us like 20, 30% more wall space. So we ended up adding to it another 3,500 square feet add-on construction to the house. So it ended up being, okay, that's from my book because I couldn't find, I couldn't find a, a better picture. That's the living room. When I say a big space, that's the upper hall and the lower hall and the living room. And you see, you get the idea. Who yeah. is that, uh, that statue by? John Langendorfer. Yeah. He loved me. He loved making things out of metal. Wow. Um, and that was all metal with eyes that lit up. He plugged <laughs> it in and his eyes were red. And we love that kind of stuff. It was hokey, but we loved that. Yeah, my wife wouldn't let me have that in the house, but uh, that's that's impressive. The piece up there is Barclay Shaw. Ended up being a, a kaleidoscope, I think, was the book cover. But it was made out of styrofoam. Hmm. Styrofoam packing boxes that he glued. And the only piece that's painted is you can see the little canvas square there. Yeah. Uh, if you can see that. Uh, that part portion with the, with the man in it, yes, is the only part that's painted. The rest of it is glued on styrofoam packing box materials that he's air, uh, air sprayed, paint sprayed. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope you entertained a lot while you were. In it was a great house for entertaining. Yeah, I can see. Oh, we had parties, easily 80 to 100 people. We loved having parties, especially Halloween parties every year. One year when the, I think it was the world, uh, or the world fantasy was close enough in College Park, uh, we rented buses and bus people in from the convention every couple of hours so people would come and visit and have That's a great. house. Yeah, we had a good time doing that. You know, um, if you have it, why not share it? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. otherwise, who's going to see it, you know, if, if you don't do that? Wow. Well, that's yeah. spectacular. Yep. We had a good time. Um, I think next is 2005. We still were buying at auction. This we finally got from Heritage. And interestingly, this was this was actually owned by somebody else whom we knew who bought it from Illustration House. But we found an interesting thing because of, of auctions that people thought they'd get more money. If they put it at auction, they'd be competition and make more money than if they sold it privately. We offered them actually what we ended up paying for it. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. The only difference is we ended up paying a premium and he ended up paying a premium. So he lost and we lost, but it was the same amount of money. Right. Okay. Uh, because he thought there'd be competition and there wasn't any in 2005 for this. Just us who wanted it originally and were beaten out at Illustration House because he got there first and bought it. And we saw it and we said, we want it. And I said, sorry. You know, Roger said, I'm sorry, but somebody's taking it already. Well, you know, illustration art has definitely matured a lot since 2005. But, you know, back then, I mean, you know, Heritage has done a, a lot of work, obviously, in promoting illustration auctions. And, and lots. it's taken a while for it to get to a point where I think that people are appreciating the, the work a lot more. 
uh, you know, it's deservedly so, certainly. But um, but yeah, in 05, it was still a little bit challenging to find two or three collectors probably that wanted the exact same piece and were willing, and were willing to, to pay the, the price, correct. Yeah. whatever the reserve was or whatever it, you know, got up to, correct. But I love the piece, you know, Synthetic Man of Mars, Olarski. It's a great piece, to me anyway. Oh, no, it's gorgeous. What, do you remember the size on something like this? Uh, it's about, uh, I'm going to say 25 by 35, 36. Wow. It's I big. Was gonna say, I was going to say two by three, but yeah, I agree. That's, that's oh, no, pretty big. impressive. Yeah, yeah, it's big. Wow. And it's funny, uh, uh, you know, all the things that, there, there came a time when we knew people who would like, swap out their art. They would rotate their art instead of getting bigger houses, you know, or they would warehouse it or they would keep it in the closet and they would mm -hmm. you know, rotate. We couldn't do that. These pieces were too big, you know, trying to find another. Every time we did a rehanging, which we tried to do it from time to time, we'd have to rearrange the art, as you can see from the house, you know, salon style, right? right. Mm -hmm. It was a major effort, you know. We had a lot of holes in our wall. <laughs> but you had a lot of art to cover them up, though. Well, we did. We did. Yes. But I, I get what you're saying. It's not, you know, you see my back wall. I never want to change it. Once I put it up there, I, yeah, I'd love to. I think about it, and then I think, oh, my gosh, well, the we, work involved. <laughs> it's interesting. Like, we would try to do this from time because, you know, you, you're, you become inured to what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And when you move it, it looks new. It takes on a different from the lighting, the the environment, you know, the space that it's filling. And so it, you get, it gets a new boost as a viewer. You see things that you may not have seen before. So there's something to be said for rehanging and moving things around. Sure. Yeah, because other, you get you, you walk into the room, you don't see it anymore. You're so used to seeing it, you don't really look at it anymore. And moving it forces you to see it. So That's pretty sad. Um, so that brings us up to 2005. But I think the next thing we're going to backtrack a little, I think. Um, because by the time we went to the world... I think it's the World Fantasy Convention in the Docklands in England. I met Paul Barnett. Paul Barnett, it turns out, uh, wrote under the name of John Grant. So you may see his name on books as John Grant. But at the time, Paul was the list manager for Paper Tiger Books in England. And at the time, it was the premier publisher. Um, it was the, historically, the the end of the dragon dream that Roger Dean started in the mm -hmm. 70s. I don't know if you're familiar with that and his early books that he did uh, that were basically uh, album covers, record album yeah. covers. No, was, very familiar with Roger Dean's work, yeah, love yes. it. But so he did these books, he called his company Dragon's Dream and, he, and that from the record album books, he started producing single artist compendiums for well-known like Pat, Patrick Woodruff and uh, Rodney Matthews, um, you know, all the major artists of the day back then in the 70s and early 80s. And by the time I came along, uh, Paul Barnett was managing that list for them and the publications and everybody who was anybody, just like anybody who's anybody had collector card sets back in from, you know, comic images or FPG, remember mm -hmm. that at the time? Well, back in the day, everybody who was anybody had their own art book. So Paper Tiger had a monopoly on those. And Paul said, hey, you have a collection. How would you like to have a art book? He said, sure. Are you serious? Of course. So sure enough, Frank Collection. And so that's book number one, which held about 120 pieces, which at the time was about 20% of the collection. By this time, we had about 700 paintings plus sculptures on our walls. And so we picked out... And you can see Mr. Yellow Jacket is there. And there's a Finley bottom right. And I'm trying to think of, uh, yeah, Chris Moore and uh, St. Allen and a, and a Giger sculpture. I, was that. I thought that was a Giger statue there. Yes, yes, it is. That we commissioned and we bought through his agent in New York, Les Barony. Wow. Um, well, not many people can say they owned anything by by him, you know. Yes, we owned a painting, and um, we owned the sculpture, and I believe it was the only one because he had so much trouble doing it, 
uh, it's the walk from the watch series and he it had so much difficulty casting it that I don't think he made any more than one of them. It was going to be more than one, but I don't think he ever did. And um, yeah, getting it through customs from Switzerland. That was a whole, whole <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it was heavy as hell. Yeah. We had to slide it down the stairs. You saw the stairs there, right? Mm -hmm. Got a blanket with three people. <laughs> it down the stairs, <laughs> rolling it down, sliding it down, <laughs> and then setting it up. Anyway, so that was the first book in 2000. And then uh, the second book came along. He said, well, we did so kind of well with the first one. Let's do the second one. And so there we go. And the, actually, down at the bottom right is the other Alan Anderson, the Sargasso of Lost uh, Seas. And um, more Bonestell and the Carousel and uh, Les Edwards, bottom right, in the center, rather. Uh, I'm trying to think of hmm, Jim Warren, top left. Can't see, I think Ian Miller, can't see what that is yet. But this is the business. Anyway, so I started an association with um, Paul and Paper Tiger. And on the strength of that, I was able to get done uh, the book on John Berkey and Richard Powers, which I did for them. And there was going to be a third in the works, but didn't go through. Paper Tiger went out. I wanted to show this one. Since oh, okay. that, it was over in Heritage. I'm showing it off of their site. Okay, but there you go. That's right. It's gorgeous. So I know. It was a toss up. I had a better picture of the other one. So this was the second uh, and I didn't, Alan Anderson I didn't, that you picked I, up? I, the one I had was blurred. I couldn't find a better picture of this one because this one was just as cute. Oh my gosh, yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. That's stunning. Yep. That really is. Yep. That's a shame that the, you know there isn't that much much of his work out there. Oh. He did some, you know, others, you know, mysteries and stuff, and I think a couple of others survived, but by and large they're they're basically gone. So by this time we sort of knew everybody who had anybody, you know, in their collection. Mm -hmm. And it was tough to pry things loose. And um, the supply was not increasing. I think Bob Weinberg at some point said they were, he made an estimate of like 2,000 pieces of pulp art extant. That's all there was. And just about everything accounted for. Um, but yet we couldn't resist when this piece came up um, in 2006, only because we first saw it in 1987 at an Ackerman sale uh, with <laughs> McLaughlin uh, who, of Top Sale, who's no longer with us, um, sitting in the audience at auction and bidding on it. And we knew that he wanted it. He was our competition. Mm -hmm. And we bid it up and bid it up and dropped out at $9,000. And he was frustrated as hell because he had to have it. And we knew that. So we forced him to pay that price. We just played that game and took our chances and then just stop bidding. And he was stuck with it at nine, but we wanted it. And then finally, 20 years later. 20 years later, right. And it came, came up for a He died. <laughs> oh, he passed away. <laughs> and Heritage, well, took it with Heritage, him grave, got, technically. Heritage <laughs> got his estate. Uh, once again, yes, the pink elephant, Harold Macaulay. And we essentially paid the same amount of money in in dollars that we would have paid back in 1987. So we paid in 2006, 18,000. So we paid the same amount of money, but now we could afford it. Mm -hmm. We could afford it back in 1987, uh, but we finally got it. Oh um, well, no, it's 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 gorgeous. Lasting long enough, you know, maybe to see the next turn, right? Keep right. things. Uh, you know, well, that's nice. Though. I mean, something like that comes back to you and, you know, you, you don't, you don't expect it. I'm sure you're excited to see it knowing, you know, that you had tried to get it yes, yes. 20 years earlier. Yeah, weird. If you, if you last long enough in a field, like when I go to Windy City, Upcon, uh, mm -hmm. um, I see things being sold by people that I once owned, you know, and I'm one of those people that go, Oh, I used to own that. You know, I used to own that. I used to have that, you know, I sold that. Well, Sweet. 50 years of buying and selling. Yeah, you've. Uh... <laughs> or, 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 or dealing. 
like selling it for the artist. And then it changes hands and changes hands again and so right. on. And so by this time, you know, we sort of knew everybody uh, in the firmament. And then came 2008. Uh, and I realized, well, we had 750 pieces or so that something had to give. Uh, although, let's, let's talk about, this is one of those rare finds. Like every once in a while, you would go into a bookshop or something um, and find something. So on a trip to Los Angeles, I decided I was going to stop by in Santa Monica to finally meet Barry Levin, the infamous uh, guy who ran a bookshop in Santa Monica um, and sell, sold art. He had art all over the walls. So one of the few book dealers who did this. Barry was well known. And um, he was an interesting guy, he's an Orthodox Jew. And um, so it was interesting, you know, to deal with that he was crazy about science fiction fantasy art, which made him really unusual. Okay. Sure. Um, I walked in and I look around and I see this little thing and it's crude. It doesn't look like much. And I said, Mars Mountain. He said, yeah. He says, it's actually a pretty famous book. And I said, okay. And I just, on the strength of his, I mean, on the strength of looking, it was tiny. It was like, it's black and white, basically. It was six by eight inches. But it turns out to be the first cover illustration. Oh, wow. 1935. The first, It's that, that's what it's considered anyway. Um, if you, you know, nine, yeah, it says, uh, what is it? The collection of science fiction short stories by Eugene George Key, the first published in 1935 by fantasy publication, the first full length book to be issued by a publisher that specialized in science fiction. So Doug Deb, Deb says the same thing. Oh, so, so you how go. did you, uh, manage to <laughs> How did, how did you manage to uh, acquire this then? I mean, it, it, knowing the significance of this. How did I do it? I walked into his bookshop and I saw it and I bought it. And he had no, but I mean, did he know how significant it was? He, I mean, he identified it as the cover for Mars Mountain, but I don't know if he attached the same kind of um, power to it right. uh, that I did, you know, as a rarity. It was crude, as you can see. Mm -hmm. um, the illustrator, who knows, you know? Uh, but uh, it was just, you know, rare, really rare. So it was a piece I bought from him. So I, plus I wanted to do business with him. You know, I wanted to buy something from him uh, to set up in a relationship, you might mm -hmm. say. Um, and uh, proved to be okay. Yeah. Anyway, Let's... so that brings us to the first of our auctions. Uh, Norman Saunders was the cover for 2008. Um, about this time, I, as a dealer and collector, realized that we just can't wait like uh, Forey Ackerman until we're, let's say, in our late 80s, 90s and have a massive sale. The, the field cannot absorb 700 paintings at one below. There'd be no other way to do this but to gradually you know, and I spoke to collectors who all agreed, you know, they, they couldn't afford to buy all the top end if it was one in one sale. It'd have to be spaced out. Mm -hmm. So starting in 2008, 2010, 2013, and 2015, which are the next two slides here, this is the first one, we ended up with single owner sales at Heritage. This was the second one, 2010. Um, the third one was Lovecraft. That was Mike Whale and Diptych. He, he painted two paintings and made eight books out of them. But he painted two paintings and the, and the publisher sliced them and made paperbacks. I, I remember I bought them. <laughs> yeah. They actually, there actually were two paintings only. Yeah. Each yeah, about I mean, 20 but by the, 30. The, the, the covers were so striking. I, I had to get them. Very striking. I mean, so with each like like 20 by 30 paintings, but wow. anyway. And so that's what we did. And we sort of, we, I said, we've got to get this down to a manageable size. And we decided that 300, 350 paintings would do it <laughs> as manageable. <laughs> uh, 
And so that's what we did. And the last sale was 2015. And then, you know, I sold some personally. Um, then we moved in 2015, we sold the house, the end of an era. Um, and that brings us to basically, I don't know if there's another one, the last one. Yeah. yeah. From, uh, so everybody, NBC. this is the Windy City. PopeCon was about um, two or three years ago. So Jill Bauman, Robert Weiner, um, Bob Eggleton with his arms, and, and Marianne, his wife, next to Jill, and Stuart Schiff. Oh, very nice. Still here 50 years later. I've got uh, two Bob Eggletons on the wall myself. One of them is a painting of my daughter. Believe right. it or not. Yeah. And then Bob, I think, in the 80s. So no, I love he's nice, very, very nice guy. He's he he's one of those people who's been in the business a long time, uh, has seen it all. I think. Oh yeah. Uh, but uh, but no, I love seeing his stuff at IX every year. Uh, you know, that, every year that I can Absolutely. make it. Happen. Yeah. Absolutely. It's like um, it's fun. I mean, uh, Alexcon is is a strange convention for me because uh, I cannot be a dealer there. Mm -hmm. I can sit with artists and kibitz. You know, I can sit with them if, if chris moore if if jeff easley if uh, uh somebody needs my help in selling i can sit at their table and help them sell or you know just sit and say hello right mm -hmm. but i can't have a table there and sell so what i do is i'm on the program and that's how i so for 15 years i've been doing my little stand-up you know i'm collecting um which is really a different for me uh, you know, to do it on myself because at other conventions, typically I'm always on the panel. It's a panel discussion, right? Um, four to six people. And I'm just one of the four to six, you know, or the moderator or whatever, you know, for, for a long time. But this, at this, at a LuxCon, I'm actually standing up there with a little mic and, you know, PowerPoint presentation. And it's fun because I know just everybody, everybody in the audience. And I love the heckling. So I'm sort of, while I'm speaking to you, I'm looking at the comments on the right-hand side here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's, I, I, you know, IX has always been my favorite show after it came into existence. It's just so unique and uh, there's nothing else really like it out there. There's actually, there is actually a, sh uh, a show for uh, comic art that is in Italy. It was just last weekend. Luca, that it's kind of, Luca? what's that? Luca? No, no, it's actually called Lake Como. Um, oh. And it's, but it's funny, you know, it's, it's very much very, very similar to the way IX is structured. You know, it's a gallery setting effectively. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll set a chair up uh, across the table from the artist. So you're, you know, and, and, you know, attendance wise, maybe 250, 300, 350, maybe uh, attendees there, but they'll have like this last show had 115 artists at it. So very similar in feel to IX, but but I, you know, I has been out there for 15 years now. I mean, just, it, but I, I love the format, you know, and I think that it's great. And I think that, that right. it, it's That's actually right. really great for us to have something like that, you know, in our hobby as well. But I really, to me, started it because it's, it, 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 they just do such a great job and the artists really appreciate going. It's, a, you know, it's, it's something that you can tell they enjoy the camaraderie right. with each other it, as it's much as they do get it. So, it's you know, really it works. Uh, for both artists and collectors, mm -hmm. because remember I said there was a cease change around 2008. Well, actually starting the late 90s when computers started digital art and technological advances made it possible to produce book covers without painting them. Um, it put a lot of people out of work and there was a major change going on, a transitionary period that started at about 98, 99, okay? Um, and once that began, the, and there was also, Heritage started its auctions about 2002. And mm -hmm. Sotheby's and Christie's was having auctions in 1997, 98, you know, there were things like that, things happening, okay? But one of the distinct problems was that because of all of this, book publishers were in trouble and they started consolidating and the book mm -hmm. market went through tremendous upheavals, you know, book publishing. And as a result of all of these things, art shows at fan run conventions became distinctly different for collectors and for artists. 
when the publishers stopped showing up and the art directors stopped showing up and they could start getting jobs by, by sending in diskettes. Right, versus that. Yeah. Actually forcing people sure. to see their artworks in portfolios in person, the artists stopped going. They didn't need the overhead. It cost them a lot of money to do these shows, mm -hmm. travel there by plane or bring their art in and stuff like that. And if they could do it without having to do that and get the jobs, then they didn't have to do that, right? And when they stopped going, then the collectors stopped going. Was there no art there to be seen, right? Sure. And they started buying another way. It started becoming, um, it started shifting. Until now, it's really a secondary market. There's not a whole lot of primary market art by artists. Um, a lot of the artists that I started representing uh, in my first year, like, 1991, my first year in business. Um, so now it's 32 years. Um, they've run out of art for me to sell. I'm literally sold all of Jim Burns' illustrations. <laughs> so doing private commissions. He didn't need me for those. You know, doing two a year. You know, you know, Jane. What I don't, I, I've never shown you any of the uh, the artwork from from Terry. Okay. Um, I do have it right here. Um, Oh, from Terry! Wow. You remember? That's, you remember what it looked like? I it's, do. Uh, I do. I, I remember it very well. Yeah, that was where the bend was. So it's yes, uh, pretty, pretty, it. pretty well. Whoa! And I just have not I actually recorded a video with the woman who did the restoration. And That's fantastic. And the thing is, I mean, you really can't see. Like, see then you can't see any of the. The water damage was right bend. here, which no. you remember, but then the bend went all the way yes, across. Exactly. And she pretty much, you know, repaired the whole thing. She, she had to go in from the back and and cut in, and then peel it back, but to both sides to kind of help flatten it out. And she said there was a little bit of mold in there from the water damage, and she uh, she did all that. But uh, so I, I think I found the right person to do the work. But uh, please let him know that everything came out fine. I I, well, I can tell him to watch this. Yeah, no, he should, well, I, 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 re see it. I really need to, I have about a 20 minute interview with her that I need to put together that, you know, which shows before and after and, and just talks about what she did with it that I just haven't had a chance well, to edit yet. I'm telling you, good restorers are, are golden. You know, yeah. they really are an important um, part of collecting. Oh, without question. Yeah. So I've, I felt pretty lucky to have done that. But, you know, uh, uh, last question for you. And uh, I don't know, it's probably one you may or may not be able to answer. But, you know, in, in uh, comic art in the last three years, you know, since the, when the pandemic started, uh, you know, the, the value on, on comic art has doubled, tripled, you know, for the good stuff. I mean, and even the average stuff has gone up. Right. But you mentioned earlier that uh, when we had a recession in 08 and 09, that uh, you, you saw you know, a, an uptick in uh, art prices and in uh, investors coming in and that sort of thing. I mean, and, and you know, that's always been the concern for us as collectors that you know, the, when the investors comes in, it, it almost makes art uh, almost impossible to, to own, at least the choice pieces, right? I mean, it, it, has that something that you felt you saw in the last you know three years when COVID happened? I mean, did, in the in the markets that you serve, or was it was it more flat? Because I can say that at least with comic art in uh, 08 and 09, you, where you, we kind of expected things to dip, nothing dipped, but it stayed relatively you know Stay flat. Up. Nothing lost its value. But I thought it was interesting when you mentioned earlier that uh, that you were you had seen like an uptick of investors and art prices uh, increase in that that period. So just curious your thoughts on those points. Yes, uh, there's a part of every collecting field um, or genre, I should say, of collecting uh, that so for whatever reason, I, I'll, I can give the example of um, Victorian fairy paintings. OK. Uh, Amatadama, you know, pre-Raphaelite paintings. Mm -hmm. We first saw in London in galleries there. And at the time when we first saw them, they were $25,000 and we couldn't afford them. I think we just lost color. Um, Damn, light. color changed all of a sudden. Uh, yeah, we lost light. Okay. I don't know what's cooking there. Um, I didn't do anything. Whoops. Hello. There we are. Okay. Um, and then when we went back the next time, it's 65,000. And then the next time it's 125,000. We couldn't afford it at the beginning. We couldn't afford it at the end. It was just simply, and then we realized that someone, Lloyd Weber, had taken a shine to pre-Laphalite and 
single-handedly had moved the market right. by simply paying whatever price there was for it, and we'd never be able to afford it. And it's really sad when you're collecting something and you go, uh, you go from a, a point in which you enjoy buying things to a point where it's no longer fun to buy because it's exceeding your ability to pay for it. And there's some markets that are simply more speculative than others. Um, cards, dare I say it, mm -hmm. art, art uh, video games now, um, some kinds of comic art. Um, I mean, I, I laughed when Action Comic number one was like $65,000. I said, who in the world is going to spend $65,000 for a comic, right? And what is it now? A couple of million? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, as it goes up, I said, no one's going to do that. No one's going to. But obviously somebody did. And yeah. uh, if I had a crystal ball, and I knew that what I was buying today was almost guaranteed uh, to be, you know, worth four times more in four years. It'd be hard to, you know, to ignore that. But I tend to be very conservative. And one of the good things about illustration art is that it's been a pretty stable market. I mean, while there are a couple like Parrish and Rockwell that are in the half million and million mark, and Frazette is getting there, mm -hmm. it's not there. anything else is way below that. Um, had I known that pinups would be, you know, the, you know, Elbrun would be 250,000, my buy-in was $2,000. It was like that 20 years ago. Right. right? I'd go for an Elbrun. <laughs> yeah. Who, who wouldn't do that? Right. But we don't have crystal balls. So when people ask me what I should invest in, I said, educate yourself, learn the market, educate your eye, you become discerning and buy what you like. And yeah. And that's what it comes down to at the end. And I, uh, I, I, I don't sell art and I've never bought art as an investment of thinking to make a profit. Yes, it's true. Over time, it's probably done as well as, I, you know, as stocks maybe or bonds, you know, but that's not why I did it, you know, and um, you're playing with fire. You know, if it's if people say, you know, I could either buy this painting or I can send my kid to college. You know, I said, send your kid to college. You know, what's right. wrong? Well, like yeah. on a piece that you could sell for $50,000 versus yeah. holding yeah. onto it at 15. dollars so. $50, don't buy a comic, okay? Right. You know, if you have the disposable income for it, have fun. You just don't make it to money you plan to retire on. Exactly. Yeah, you, you know, can't, you can't bank on that at all. I, I get it. But well, that's interesting, though. I mean, I, you know, we've, I think that I've always kind of uh, bought what I've I've been appreciated more than anything, and I'm pretty you know and you're I'm pretty happy with that. It's it's tough not to you know when the prices reach where they 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 are you know it's it's hard not to think about it as an investment. Unfortunately, even even for the average buyer, um, it becomes a bit challenging. But but it is what it is. I mean, if you want to continue your passion and love for the hobby and own and own these pieces of art, something else to love. Yeah. I mean, just pick something else to love. I mean, there are uh, in the firmament of of illustration art. There's romances, westerns, gothics, mm -hmm. way lower price. You can still buy those. You know, just just don't try to buy Bonestell. Right. <laughs> exactly. Okay? The ship has sailed. I mean, the the market has spoken, and I'm not in charge of it. Mm -hmm. You know. At the same time, we could be buying Balagursky for ten thousand. Richard Van Dongen is selling for fifteen hundred. You know, they could be painting at the same point in time. There's there's no reason why M. Schweller is selling for so much more, and Dean Ellis is not. You know, people who are painting in the same time period. Right. You know, but the market is the market. It, it wants what it wants, and I'm not in control of that, really. You know, but. Uh, it's been the it, people have been buying enough at auction, so we know when I mentioned Ditko. I mean, we mentioned we know who are going to be the memorable comic artists by this time, and so we know that you know people are not going to be forgetting, you know, Macaulay. Exactly. Yeah. So, anyway, well, you have a question for me at the end, or 
No, I mean, I think, well, you know, I want to, I wanted to let everybody know that I did link to wow art worlds of wonder okay. uh, in the show description. And what I thought might be interesting, I'll let, and I didn't do it already was I'll put into the show description like links to some of those heritage auctions, just so they can see uh, large images of pieces that used to be in your collection. I think that, you know, like the one piece I pulled up, I think it'd be fun for people to be able to take a look at these because it, it shows really your tastes in, in artwork that, you know, it spanned many different genres and many different artists. And I think it truly shows, you know, that you, you know, had a love for the arts and, you know, across the board in illustration and uh, science fiction fantasy. And I think, you know, and sculpture too, which is phenomenal. I mean, I, you know, I'm a, I, my major in college was sculpture. So I love seeing right. Yes, there's not as much of it. I mean, there are not not as many pieces, um, mm -hmm. you know, that Clay Moore, for example, Clayburn Moore, who mm -hmm. uh, Moore Studios uh, started doing sculptures of of uh, for Marvel, you know, um, Hulk and uh, the figurines. Do you yeah. know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, no, I know exactly. When yeah. I first met him when he started. He was doing bronze sculptures, art, you know, fine art sculptures fantasy themes mm -hmm. um they were beautiful but, but he could make a living doing that you know um there are not enough people who wanted who were aware of it uh, people know how to hang paintings on their wall but they don't know how to show sculpture as easily right you know, i have to teach them you know you can put the pedestal anywhere you can put it in the corner put it on your coffee table on your mantle you know you can do these things but uh in the past week i think previously you mentioned uh, what do you do with the convention? You know, from 700 paintings now to about 40 I have. Was it hard to figure out which 40 you wanted to, to Oh, have? yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the first time we sold anything, it was really bittersweet. It was t it was tough, the, the first auction, you know, to let it go. Mm -hmm. And I still, I still get, I still have winces, you know, when I see the book and I see the art that I once owned. Um, it's hard. But you have to remind yourself that these are, you know, material possessions that you want someone else to have. And so the value of selling them rather than waiting until after you're dead is that you know whose hands they're going into. There's a pleasure in that. Right. You know, when I'm selling to someone who's 40, I know it's going to be another generation or two in the way the scheme did, at least 20 years, you know before it changes hands again and changes hands again, right? But at least I'm in charge of that. Exactly. If I wait until I was in a, you know, my will, I have no idea. While I'm alive, I know people call me when they buy things, you know, at Heritage, they say, oh, I bought your so-and-so. I have it now, right? <laughs> I know who's got it. They actually tell me, you know? Right. Um, no, and it was really wise that you did it in those four, you know, separate auctions. Cause you're right. If you would have tried selling, you know, twice that number in a single auction, it, they would have all, it would have hurt the market for some of those pieces, which is the last thing you'd want There's to do. There's that too. Yeah. There's that too. Um, uh, but, but mainly it's, it's, it's control uh, of it, you know, so you know what's happening to it, you know where it's going um, and you have some say in that. It's not just to get the money out, mm -hmm. you know, um, some people do, some people sell, uh, you know, the, the four D's, you know, divorce, death, dislike right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. uh, for selling art, but right. you don't have to wait. Uh, you can, you know, uh, plan it. But uh, as I, I have spoken about before, I really think there's a, a curve to this. There's a collecting life cycle. And um, it starts when you get enough disposable income, let's say between the ages of 25 and 40, you know, really hot buying and then you become really discerning between 40 and 60 you know it slows down you know you're picky you just need one more of this guy or one more of that or you know you get to be really like a completist you know you're not right. lacking okay uh not that you can necessarily be a completist you can with comics but you know not with uh no no i i get it i mean i'm 55 now i think i was I, I love i started collecting art when i was uh probably 34, 35, and I bought anything that I thought I, I really liked, and I had no no discerning taste whatsoever. You learn. I mean, you know. I learned a lot, right? You make a lot of mistakes. So that's the one thing we talk about in this. In, in, in well, I'm sure. Buyer's, buyer's remorse, you know. Yeah. 
there's, oh, yeah, there's, there's a lot. Uh, I, I haven't had too much of it, but I, but I, I can appreciate it in others. Uh, but then comes a time when you're 65 or so, 70, you start thinking, okay, now what? I've got, you know, 50, 40, an untold number of mm -hmm. comics, who knows what, right? Um, what do I do with this? You know, what do I do? Well, maybe uh, here's a good parting question for us. Maybe Black Viper of Dorne was curious. Uh, you know, what was one of your all-time favorite uh, pieces of art that you you had gotten on? If you had 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 to pick one, I mean, one that just even impressed yourself that you uh, were able to pick up. I mean, would it would it would it be that uh, first science fiction cover? I mean, what what would what would be that thing that really? Well, you know, that, yes, I would say that the sentimental uh, stories attached memories attached to the purchase mm -hmm. of art but in answer to the question of which is the like grail piece you know mm -hmm. um i can't say that it is it's like asking you know which of your children are your favorite uh you know people collectors figure out ways to answer that question the most common one is the last one i bought very true so my favorite right <laughs> um, on any given day you know that it, it switches you know i love them all like they're my babies, right? For different reasons. It's really hard. If there were only one that was the grail, why would I own 700 others? Very true. Like, so Howard wouldn't have had a, had a favorite piece a, either? Excuse me? Uh, your husband wouldn't have had like a uh, a favorite piece that, that uh, he had managed to acquire over the years? Since you both seem to have, you know, sort of semi, you know, there was overlap and then you both had, uh, you know, different right. tastes. We loved, the, no, we liked, the, it was a con considered, a collection, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, which is why we never traded, you know, with other people, because why should we trade something we already love for something else that we love? We already have something we love. <laughs> well, what is the point right. of that, right? Sure. We'll buy it from you if you'd want to sell it, but nobody, no, no, we only, I only trade. Sorry. Now, sometimes the trade becomes impossible to resist, you know, and so later on, we got a little laxer about that. I mean, we did end up doing that but by and large no i mean if we if we only had 10 or 15 pieces that were really the core the major pieces that we loved we would sell off all the rest so why would you have them right so you love them all equally almost well not equally but yeah yeah Election. no that's 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 a wonderful uh place I, to be i think yeah i don't know how else to put it but it's you know so I don't know what I'm going to do with the 35 that I still love, but you know. <laughs> well, you got, you still have walls and uh, the walls need art. We, you know, we say that a lot around here on the channel. So uh, you got to, you, you can't sell everything. No, you can't. Actually, what I, I did do though, I'll share from Windy City. I brought in one piece, which I ended up selling, but I couldn't resist. I had to buy one okay. to make the hole on the wall. And it was a Western, the first one I've ever bought. Oh, wow. Vern Tossi, 1943. And it fit the space perfectly? Yeah, and I'm living in Santa Fe. So I, I gotta have something that's Western. <laughs> right? right, no, no, now now you're uh, you're uh, a part of the neighborhood oh, property. That's right, I'm opening up a new can of worms. Who knows where this will lead? It's, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, it's been fun doing this. Yeah, Jake, this was a lot, honestly, this this was great. Uh, you know, I knew I would have a lot of fun doing this. And, and now at least when I see you at IX, I won't walk past you. I'll be happy to introduce myself. Absolutely not. And if I give a talk, maybe you can attend it this year. Yeah, no, I will. I will. I, I've only did, I, I did a panel there once and I don't even remember what it was, what it was for. I, it was, I was with uh, Donato and a few other people. We were probably talking about something related to book publishing or something. Not but sure. uh, well, Last year I did... I took a chance on this and Pat said, Oh yeah, do it, do it on NFTs. Oh no. Oh yeah. Let's oh. Not go there. We don't, we, we don't talk about NFTs on we this channel. Talk about, no, we don't talk about, no, <laughs> no, not, not at all. It's uh, yeah. Well, the thing is it, it, it comes back to, you know, we're, we're uh, traditional art collectors, right? <laughs> we, it, just like, uh, you know, we, we like the, to hold a piece of paper in our hand. It's, you know, NFTs are just so right. alien to us. I mean, I our I kids mean. and their kids might be interested in it, but yeah. uh, it, exactly. you, you can't teach uh, collectors who've, who are so used to something tangible that they can hang on their wall. Yeah. I knew uh, I had to put it in the audience. 
I knew I would have a sympathetic audience, you know. Oh, oh yeah. Well, there's so many problems. I mean, yeah. I just wrote the forward to the current uh, Infected by Art, you know, and I had to talk about AI and and, and, other, and a few other things. And it was just, you know, times are changing, right? I mean, you kind of have to keep... You, it, it, it's, it's it, you can't stop technology, unfortunately. You know, you know. It's like Journeyman and you know other other programs are, you know, driving a lot of debate. But right. um, I'm I'm for tangibility. Same here, and I yeah. think everybody in the audience is too. Uh, you know, that's that's how it is. But no, it was good that you did. I mean, at the end of the day, it's uh, these are topics that at least need to be discussed so people can. Uh, you know, express their opinions about it. And uh, yeah, but at the end of the day, fortunately, you know, a couple of years ago, like around the time you would, or say a year and a half ago, uh, you know, it was a hot topic, but it's died off, you know, and, and why did it die off? At the moment, the, uh, you know, the publishers and the IP holders realized that uh, there's money to be made, everything gets st gets stopped, right? I mean, it's, the, it's that's, and that'll put a halt to uh, to anything really widespread happening until well, they can figure out how to monetize it. As I said during my talk, but it applies to a lot of other collectibles as well. It does, yeah. Um, you need to be aware of pump and dump, okay? Um, mm -hmm. You have to be attuned to those kinds of games. And unless you're close to the pump, you're going to be screwed, okay? So- very true. You have to be very careful about those things, you know, uh, as I said, pump and dump. And that bubbles like that. So <laughs> what can I say? Be, be wary. Be wary. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. No, no, I get it. Well, listen, Jane, again, this was a lot of fun. And I, you know, I think we'll stay in touch. And I will, uh, once I get that video posted, uh, that will show like the close up pictures of befores and afters with this thing. I, I hope you okay. share that with Terry so he knows that everything came out fine. And uh, and I learned a lot. I really did. And I think, it, and at the end of the day, it's kind of good that I was able to document it because I'm able to show it now to other collectors and say, you know, if, if something like this happens to your work or you find a piece of art that you want to buy that has pre-existing issues, you can get them fixed. And, uh, you know, and here was a, here was a great example for something like that. That's so, right. and, and I, I love the piece. I talked about this numerous times, you know, it's from a book that uh, I read to death when I was a teenager, you know, that I just, you know, is it whatever, Galactic Aliens, what a dumb kind of thing, right? But I it's loved the it. The heyday of those books. The right. Oh, and oh, yeah. to be able to actually own it, like I told you, I, will, I looked at this artwork on your site for three years. Every year I think about buying it. Every year you'd send out that email about the, the sale. <laughs> right. And I'd look at it and I think this is going to be the year. And then I'm like, no, yeah. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to no. do it, but I want it so yeah. bad. But you know, some artists that can they it was really um, uh, a gimmick at the time. Mm -hmm. Um that uh, uh young artists agency connived with publishers to come up with ideas like uh TTA books, you know, the terrestrial the, the terra. Uh, oh, yeah. the whatever authority right mm -hmm. uh, and other compendiums like that uh that actually were just showcases for the artists who were working in the day um and they all contributed to it you know Good. Fred you know and all the rest and terry oaks and all the brits contributed to these books and it was like a, a very special time between seven, 1978 and 82 approximately mm -hmm. 83 when these books were done um, there were just memorable images, you know. Right. Well, that's why, like I mentioned, with uh, Ian yeah. Miller's work in the Tolkien Beast theory. I mean, that book didn't need to exist outside of the fact that you know it presented uh, me with eight or nine new artists that I'd never uh, knew right. about before. Yeah, and I mean, Angus Mackay and and you know all these artists, you know, uh, Chris Foss, mm -hmm. you know, all the things we you know all started that way by contributing to these books, you know, right. spaceships and you know. I love them. They, that's why I, I love I love that stuff to this day. Uh, but again, thank you for doing this. I thank everybody in the chat for hanging out with us tonight. This was a lot of fun. I, and uh, Jane, I mean, again, I look forward to getting to see you in person. And yeah. and I'll buy, I, I, you know, I'm I'm living in Florida now, so I, I'll I'll uh, make sure that I buy you lunch or a beer or something. I'll try to have that Southern charm that you you saw in the '70s and well, '80s. When you, start, you mentioned a convention, let me know, and you know, I might travel down south. All right. Well, I, I'm actually starting my own art uh, only uh, show here in uh, in Orlando starting in 2024. Okay. Uh, it you know, so it'll be a little different than what Patrick's doing up there. But uh, but, you know, a lot of those artists kind of cross over into comics, too. So I, my my hope okay. is to have a, a show that kind of touches in uh, on a lot of areas of illustration, comic books, sequential arts, illustration. I, have, I just bought in fact, I just bought a comic cover by Ken Barr. I oh, saw wow. I saw all his illustration art that he did. Hello? 
for yeah, um, there it goes. for uh, for uh, for Zebra and other books back sure. was up back in the seventies. I sold all his illustration art, but he was known for comic art as right, well. Right, of course. So yeah, no Ken Bar, yeah, knows his work well. Uh huh. So there's crossover like that as well. Absolutely. So. All right. Well, again, I thanks for doing this. <laughs> I will see you uh, hopefully in October this year. Absolutely. And uh, again, thanks everybody for tuning in. Have a wonderful evening. Adios. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.